Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. We are recording here at the Mormon Stories Podcast Studios in Holiday, Utah, and I could not be more excited for my guests today. My guests are Linda and Savannah Clyde. Hey, guys. Hey. Hi. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. It's good to be here. Um, I don't expect that a ton of you will know who uh, Linda and Savannah Clyde are. I learned about Linda first. Um, uh, a month or two ago when I learned that Linda had worked for five years for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS.org, Mormon.org, as a copywriter in, I think, what she describes as their marketing department, but it, it's really um, writing headlines and title and copy for LDS.org, Mormon.org, and many other um, internet assets and other things that we'll learn about today. But it's interesting to think about it. Sometimes you can look at the church through a corporate lens, kind of like it's a corporation. And sometimes you can look at its different business units as units of the business. And and if you look at it that way, and I think Linda characterizes it that way, she worked for the marketing arm of the LDS church. So she has a lot of insider perspective and information about how they think about um, the messages that they share with members in the world, the headlines, search engine optimization, and just how they get the message out to the world and market the product, market um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, but that's not the only reason we're interviewing Linda. Um, I stumbled also on her, someone recommended her TikTok channel to me. She has a TikTok channel um, where she has been sharing her experiences um, as a Mormon and her experiences working with the church. And it's just a, it's a lovely, thoughtful, um, and fun, uh, TikTok channel. And of course, you know, Mormon stories podcast is, is working to, um, to become involved on all the platforms where we can help get the message out and fulfill the mission of the open stories foundation, which is to, um, help provide informed consent for current, past and future potential members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We think everybody should know the truth about the church. And then, of course, the Open Stories Foundation and Mormon Stories Podcast wants to help people who are in a faith transition or who have left the church. We want to help them find healing, growth, and community in or out of the church. We just want to um, fill the voids that the church is not able to support. So um, as I stumbled upon Linda's TikTok channel, learned about her story, I thought it would it'd be really cool to have her in to tell her story, but that's not it. As I learned more about Linda's story, um, I also learned about Savannah. And it turns out Savannah, Savannah is 19 years old. Yes. Is that right, Savannah? <laughs> and Savannah was an important part of Linda's journey, um, helping Linda see the Mormon church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints more clearly. And Savannah's got her own story of sort of being a, a teen middle school and high school in Utah County and uh, what that was like for her. And so this is just one of the types of Mormon Stories podcast episodes I love most are kind of parent-child, mother-daughter uh, sort of stories, kind of like, uh, you know, Lee and Cody Young and, and Brinley Young and so many others, uh, the the Hackings and their son Kyle, um, Donna Showalter and, and her son, uh, Michael, just uh, we we love those types of stories, and so uh, guys, I'm just so excited to have you here. Did I get anything wrong in the introduction? No, no. it's great. Anything That's you want to add or correct? No, it's great. It's no? a great introduction. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, and of course, we are so excited to have with us in studio, Kara Burrell. Hey, um, Kara. Kara Burrell has uh, has been working with us now for a month or two. Uh, she does so many important things for us, including here in studio, producing these episodes, helping with the, the um, cameras and the audio, time codes now. We just want to make sure everybody understands that for all YouTube videos going forward, we, we provide time codes in the description where you can jump. Is it, are they called time codes? What are what are you Gen Xers, Gen Zers call them these days? <laughs> um, they, that is not me. I am definitely a millennial. What are they called? I, I mean, I understood what you meant. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> time For codes, sure. timestamps. All right. Time, time stamps, time codes, where you can actually see an outline of what we're going to be talking about and jump to certain sections of the interview, either to go back and see things you really liked or 
to jump forward or back to parts you you want to review. So, care you know care helps with those time codes. Um, she provides important, insightful, funny, witty, thoughtful commentary, and um, and that's in addition to the the support of Brooklyn Alden, who does our editing, and Gerardo, who does our cinematography and our thumbnails. Because of your support, we are able to do so much more now um, uh, in the Open Stories Foundation with Mormon Stories. But Kara, it's just so great to have you uh, with us. Yeah, it's been so much fun working for you, John, and working with Gerardo in Brooklyn and meeting the guests and interviewing. And I was just chatting with our lovely guest here. I think this is going to be a really good one. I think everyone should buckle up. It's going to be very insightful, I can tell already. These are two very intelligent ladies. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. So, uh, yeah, so without any further ado, we are going to jump into Linda and Savannah's story. And this is going to be one of those, you know, multi-hour, three to four hour kind of interviews. But I promise you, it's going to be worth it. So uh, how's that for a buildup? There you go. You guys feel all right? (laughs) (laughs) All right, Linda, well, let's start. Okay. Where does your Mormon story begin? Um, My Mormon story begins uh, in Utah County. Born and raised there, um, I I was born in Payson and uh, raised Mormon. Uh, kind of, I will kind of put kind of in there just because my uh, my mom was more of a believer. My dad had his questions um, back in the eighties. My dad attended BYU and uh, the religion classes really put him off. Really? Yeah. He was there when I was there. Honestly, uh, probably. Yeah. I like it would have been early eighties. Yeah. Uh-huh. So okay, I was there late eighties. Okay, <laughs> so sometime around there, yeah. So, so I grew up. He had a faith, did he have a faith crisis? You know, he didn't talk to us about it a lot, but he was very antagonistic. I'll say that much toward the church, and and as a young kid, it really affected my relationship with him too, because I was I was born kind of a believer. I just, you know, going to church for me was, I loved the stories. I loved primary. I loved God. I loved Jesus. I loved Joseph Smith. I loved Joseph Smith. I thought I identified with Joseph Smith in many ways. I just felt like, you know, I spiritually, you know, I thought, okay, I would, I would be one to go and kneel in a, in a forest grove and pray and, and actually believe that I was receiving, you know, a response it to a prayer. So I don't know, it wasn't hard for me to follow the Joseph Smith story. And I, I was, um, I really identified with what I was told about Joseph Smith early on. So uh, with, with your, with your dad. So I'm assuming he, he met your, did, did he meet your mom at BYU? And you know, did, did your mom know that he was struggling and did they get married in the temple? Like tell us about their, okay. what you know about their courtship prior. Okay. So, um, my mom did not go to college and she, um, that's one of her biggest regrets actually. Um, so my dad was, uh, he did the whole BYU thing, um, graduated in construction management, but they met, they were high school sweethearts. Um, my husband and I are also high school sweethearts, so they couldn't say anything to us when, <laughs> Long line, <high> <laughs> yeah, <sweethearts>. anyway, <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But, um, yeah, so I don't know that she really knew full on, but they were married civilly first. Um, and when I think when my mom was expecting my oldest sister, she, uh, they went through the temple at that point. And I don't remember, really remember hearing any stories or any negativity about their temple experience. They didn't attend the temple. We weren't super active growing up. My mom made sure we went through all the rites and rituals as, as kids. Um, and my dad actually performed all the rites and rituals. So he was in enough to do that, to bless and baptize all of us. So uh, things started to change a little bit uh, once I got to be, you know, once we started getting married, you know, that was, um, and I don't know what he was reading during all of that time, but we, we weren't ones that really did uh, follow the family home evening. We didn't have family prayer. We didn't have, we were often known as the inactives um, in the ward. And I, I often felt that growing up. I knew that when specific young women were reaching out to me, that it was a fellowshipping thing. Um, and I, I was grateful to them and I was appreciative that they would reach out to me. Um, but I did feel a little bit othered growing up. And I think that my sisters felt the same way too. So I don't know, we just didn't really talk a whole lot, especially with my dad, we didn't talk a whole lot about religion. Um, but, but we knew that there was conflict because if we ever did talk much about it, he would kind of shut it down pretty quick. You know, um, if we were ever talking about 
I don't know, testimonies or talking about the church, he would, it would ruffle his feathers. We knew that much that it would upset him. So as we got to be more, uh, if you talked positively about the church, mm-hmm. it would upset your dad. So, so like yeah. th- this is, you know, most of the people that we interview on Mormon stories podcast are raised in these hyper Orthodox, mm-hmm. super faithful. Um, and this, so this is really inter- more Mormon families. Mm-hmm. This is super interesting. Yeah. So I guess you don't, you don't know, or you didn't know if your dad just didn't believe if yeah. your mom did or didn't believe, if they were just cultural Mormons to fit the mold, yeah. but privately had doubts. Did you have any idea why you guys were lukewarm Mormons growing up in, in Utah County, right? Is, is Payson yeah. Utah County? It, yeah, Payson is Utah County. We weren't actually in Payson. I, I grew up in Spanish Fork. Oh, Spanish Fork. Okay. But I was born in Payson. So um, my mom would talk to us a lot about church. My mom taught me to pray. Um my mom would talk to us about religion. She would answer our questions. She would encourage us to go to church. Um, and she, if we were going to church, she was the instigator. She was the one that was taking us. Um, I do remember my dad being there sometimes, but it was always, um, he was always bored out of his mind and trying to entertain, (laughs) trying to entertain us. I remember, I don't know if anybody ever did that hand thing where you like sit with each other and you like push all the blood out of your hand and then you pretend to pull a string out of the middle of your hand and the blood rushes back in. My dad did that with, that's my memory of my dad or like circle all the in church is just kind of playing with our, playing with our hands and playing little tricks and Tim telling us little jokes. And it was never like engaging with what was being spoken over the pulpit really. And so I had so much cognitive dissonance as a kid because I was, I was getting, as a little kid, I was getting these two really strong messages, you know, pro-church, which I really, really identified with. And then, you know, my dad's really antagonistic view. And for me as a young kid, all I could do was look at my dad and think, dad, why? What's wrong with you, dad? You know, why aren't you being a priesthood leader? Why aren't you doing, you know, A, B, C, and D that we were taught? to do. And so it's tough. It like really damaged my relationship with him as a young kid. So, um, and I remember once, like just to kind of, as an example of, of when the cognitive dissonance was really strong, just a memory. Cause I remember driving in the car with my family and my parents were in the front seat. I was in the back and with my sisters and my dad was, my mom and dad started having a conversation about Joseph Smith and my dad started to kind of go off on Joseph Smith. And I remember like breaking down, sobbing in the back seat because I did not know what to do with the information. I was, I, I loved Joseph Smith. I loved the story. And I thought, why, how could anybody hate Joseph Smith? It was tough. It was really, really tough. And I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know who to turn to. My mom was kind. My mom would listen but I don't feel like she could really help me. She was, my mom has always been sandwiched between, um, she was sandwiched between her parents because her dad was not really a believer and her mom was a believer. So she was sandwiched too her whole life. She's been kind of stuck in the middle. And so again, here she is in this situation. She's got her husband. She's got to keep the peace with her husband, you know, but yet kind of just in case it's true, she feels like she has to teach her kids the truth. So she was in a tough position position. So she would help me. She would talk things through with me. I did have a grandmother that I would turn to, um, who was super stalwart Mormon. And, and she kind of gave me the special complex. She told me that I was special because I was so spiritual because I was such a believer as a kid. Um, and so I, that's where I got value was from my grandma. Cause I wasn't really getting it at home. I didn't, so anyway, I just really identified with that spirituality and that was praised through my grandma. My relationship with my dad was, was really rough growing up. I couldn't connect with him and you don't want to feel like your dad's bad, you know, but I had a lot of those moments where it's like, I just hated him because he wouldn't, I was like, because it was, church was good for me. Everything about it seemed good and wonderful. And I felt good when I was there. Um, so the, the nonconformity of my dad was really, really difficult as a kid. So mm. that's so hard to be split. Yeah. Your parents and, yeah. Especially being, and young. it's hard how, you know, usually this comes at the end of a story mm-hmm. when an interviewee enters into a mixed faith marriage, right? but you were born into a, a mixed faith, you know, with mixed faith parents. Yes. And I could just imagine the tension is. Yeah. 
Yeah, the tension was really tough. I, I remember once, and I know that my sisters felt the same uh, just because we were going to church, we were being indoctrinated. And so, you know, we all wanted to save dad. <laughs> you know, we all wanted to help dad figure it out. Um, and once my sister and I remember going down to, once she could drive, going down to a store with her, like a church bookstore. I can't remember what, it was probably a desert book. And it was some kind of a church bookstore and trying to find just the right book that would help my dad, that he might like, he might listen to, he might find something in it that would help him see and understand, you know, that, that the church was true and that's what he needed to do, help him live up to his covenants. You know, all of these things that we were being indoctrinated with. So we spent hours, I just remember just her and I just pouring over all these books. And we finally settled on a book um, by Von J. Featherstone. And it was a book about Jesus Christ. And I thought, we thought, okay, this is safe because we, we clearly were able to pick up at that point that, um, that it was a lot of the church leaders that he had trouble with. So if we focused on Jesus Christ, that that was probably something that was safe. We wrapped it up and gave it to him, you know, as a gift and he opened it up and I, and I feel sad sharing this cause I know he would be sad to hear this now, but, um, he just looked at it and just said, what is this? You know, mm. sat it down. It was like, I don't want this. And it crushed us, you know, cause we were just, we just wanted to help. We just wanted to feel that connection, um, that spiritual connection with dad. So it was especially hard on me. I don't, I haven't talked to my sister about that for years, but um, that we, there were a lot of moments like that growing up that were really hard. So just being sandwiched in a home like that, I did have people that I, I turned to, but um, yeah, like I said, grandma, I had a grandma that I turned to a lot that was really helpful during those times, but it never went away. It was a hard house, a hard roof, roof to live under because there was constant contention mm -hmm. over religion mm -hmm. in our home. So, yeah, the, tough. I mean, the, the church, I think the church, more church really believes that families are the most important thing and it often yeah. leads in marketing <laughs> mm -hmm. with this idea that families are the most important thing, that families are eternal and that the whole purpose of life is families. Right. And so we all are raised thinking that, oh, well, that's what the church does. It strengthens families. But now, you know, for the past 10 or 20 years, I've been realizing that it doesn't always strengthen families. No, no. Um, and I think that that's kind of where I'm at now. I mean, no, I won't jump forward, but um, looking back, um, it's never united my family just from the very beginning. And even my grandparents' story, um, I'm named after my grandparents' baby. They lost a baby when she was an infant her, and her name was Linda. I was named after her. Um, and their story uh, religion also kind of was a dividing thing for them as well. And um, my grandma clung to religion because she believed that that was the only way she was ever going to see that baby again. And, um, and the loss, the loss of the baby would made their marriage really hard. But um, my grandma was often a little bit difficult to live with because of how, how strict she lived it and how, um, and her expectations around, um, around religion, but it, but a lot of it stemmed from that grief and that, um, indoctrination, the belief that in order to be with that baby again and raise that baby in the next life, she had to follow A, B, C, and D, you know, and that's a pretty motivating factor to keep people in, to keep people, you know, following and doing everything that they're told to do. You know, it just the way that it, it um, the church gets into every family relationship, you know, between my grandma and her baby, my, my grandma and her marriage, you know, between my my dad and my mom, between my dad and all of us sisters. Um, so it, it's um, I'm losing patience <laughs> with with how much it's been involved in my family and my family relationships. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm so. Sorry. so so how did your childhood and teen years progress? Well, um, I loved the church through, um, through childhood, through my teen years. Um, teen years were, I, like I said, I married my high school sweetheart. So my husband was a part of my life starting 
I knew him from sixth grade on, but we were, we were friends until about our sophomore year in high school. Um, and we, we were both active. His family is, is far more, ma- more active than mine ever was. <laughs> Vanikin. <There's>, yeah. <laughs> Attest to that. <laughs> very active, very Mormon. Um, but his family has their own things too. So, um, but he and I, uh, we believed we wanted to, you know, we, we, our plan was to get married in the temple. And I, I think, think, feel like for me, I was, I was seeking somebody that would, would be the things that my dad wasn't, um, maybe subconsciously. Um, I wanted, I wanted a priesthood holder. I wanted all the things that I thought were going to make everything better. So, um, but, we we did not really follow the the typical path either. He decided that he did not want to serve an LDS mission. Once we hit kind of that senior, the senior year, he didn't want to. And we were broke up for a se- or senior year for a little while. And that's kind of when he f- really made that decision. And he um, got a lot of backlash from making that decision. Um, most of it came when he decided that he was going to get married at such a young age. We got married the October after we graduated high school. So super young. So let me just ask, uh, so you guys met, you met at what age? We were in sixth grade when we met. So we were really good friends all the way up until about our sophomore year. And then we started dating. And did you, did he communicate in those, let's just say early high school years that he was that super faithful, you know, uh, kid that would be the non-dad, you know, that would be the not your dad kind of. <laughs> um, I felt confident. We, we liked to talk about, um, about spiritual things. He was very open to talking about all of those things. Um, I don't know that he communicated that he was going to be, um, the poster boy <laughs> for sure. <laughs> he was the oldest in his family. Um, so I know that he did feel some pressures there. He knew the expectation that was there to go on a mission. His dad did serve a mission. Um, and I, but his mom raised the kids a lot alone because his dad worked for WW Clyde and was out of town a lot. So it was kind of just home on the weekend. So um, his dad wasn't necessarily the strongest example with pushing missions. So I don't know that it, it clearly, it didn't really stick. He decided that that wasn't going to be for him, that he didn't want to go. Um, but he had people say, you know, we've invested so much in you. You know, he was Eagle Scout at like age 13. He was, he went to church every single week. They were active. I ended, I did go to church with them sometimes when, um, when we were in high school, just because my family wasn't super active. So um, yeah, so he, I, as far as, you know, promising to be that, I, I felt confident that he would be better at that than your dad, than my dad had been. And it's just so it, it's unfortunate that in these, th- this is one of the biggest tragedies of a mixed faith marriage. Yeah. Well, it's the kids view the non-believing parent as a disappointment or as a failure oh, or yeah. as inadequate. And then I'm just thinking about how you're trying to find a boyfriend that won't be your dad and what that, what that's like for your dad and what that's like for your relationship with your dad yeah, and, and just how that can, sometimes we talk about how people can be bitter, like mm-hmm. non-believers can be bitter or angry. Yeah. I just wonder what it would be like, not, not to say that your dad's was perfect or that, you know, that, that there are white hats and black hats, but just what does it do to live year after year after year where someone in a family feels like a constant disappointment to everyone, including their own children? Or like you're yeah. focusing on what they're not instead of everything that they are. Yeah. 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 And I have so much guilt now. No, no, no. And I'm not trying to rub that <laughs> in. No, 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 no. I, that's, that's just me. Like, um, it was, I know that it was really hard for him and I can have compassion for that now. I have a lot of compassion for that now. I couldn't at the time, um, I just was so angry, so angry at him um, for, for just so much. Just like, and, and I think part of that too is just he, he lacked a lot of tact when he would say something. So that's a lot, that's sure. a lot, of, that's a lot, just personality, you know, yeah. he's just blunt yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. But, but also like some people in your position would have tried to find the biggest Peter priesthood in this high school <laughs> to make sure 
yeah. that history wouldn't repeat itself. Yeah. And it sounds like you kind of tried, but you also just I married, had a best friend. I married my dad in many ways, though. <laughs> and, and we, we do that. We do that sometimes, right? Yeah. And my husband is is super, super driven. Um, it just they're they're a lot alike in many, many ways. Uh, my husband is just has better social skills <laughs> in some ways, better people skills. He's less blunt and he's more soft spoken. And that's really what I needed the most. So um, I accepted the fact that he did not want to go on a mission. And I kind of embraced that early on. Because and his reason again was, was what? He didn't want to. And I think. But he believed? Uh, yeah, he was a believer. But I feel like um, I've always steered the religion bus. For us. Very much so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Vanica can attest to that. That he is very, um, but his dad is rather passive too. So his example was pretty passive when it came to that. Um, his mom leads and drives the religion bus too in their home, I think for the most part. So that was normal and familiar to him too. I was, I was familiar. My, me driving the, <laughs> driving the religion bus, that's just what came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, so he was okay with it. And I... I was all right with him not going on a mission for multiple reasons. Um, one, we, I'm going to just put it out there. We, we were sexually active before, before we, we got married. And that was a, that was a tough thing too. Um, especially when people found out that we weren't getting sealed in the temple right off the bat, it was like, oh my gosh, she's pregnant. Everybody was like, oh, she must be pregnant. Here we go. You know? Um, I didn't feel, I mean, clearly we didn't feel worthy to go to the temple at that point, but it wasn't like that was not a goal for us. That was something that we wanted to do that we'd talked about. That was definitely the direction I was steering us toward and he was fine with that. Um, but the worthiness issue there was, it was really difficult for me to, um, feeling worthy to go to the temple. Um, that took, that took a long time to get to that point. We were married for a couple of years before, um, before we got to that point, where we were ready to go to the temple. But this is a, this is a tough question. And, um, I, I hope it comes across the way I intend it, but yeah. so knowing that your parents had so much conflict, knowing that at the time your dad was such a disappointment, mm -hmm. knowing the life and this is not a shaming question. Yeah. It's a question to help others understand mindsets. Yeah. Because it's very human and developmentally normal what, what you were doing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But tell us what that was like in your brain to, to not want to have the marriage your parents had, mm -hmm. to not want to have the husband that your, your dad was to your mom, mm -hmm. and yet to maybe not be fully living the church's standards. What was that like for you in your mind at the time? Like living that conflict? Yeah. Um, and again, what you were doing is perfectly normal. For me, right? I think what was driving really, Indian, even on a very subconscious level, what was driving my decision-making with getting married so young and following that path, which was very similar to my own parents, was I wanted out of my parents' home. The conflict there was very difficult for me and my and my husband getting married. That was the only way I saw out because I didn't see it as a um, I I didn't I didn't really envision myself as a, a, a college student or I, I had this I was going to be a Mormon mommy, you know. That's that's really the the, the paradigm that I had. I never even considered anything else. Never considered it. Which, and maybe it was just the example that I had of my mom, my mom didn't, wasn't a college grad, you know, that I was just following the pattern that it had been set for me. So, um, I don't know that I was thinking about it super. I mean, I wanted my husband to be, maybe I felt like I could shape him some <laughs> mm -hmm. on a subconscious level, you know, that he was, he was kinder, more soft-spoken and he would listen and we were very close. So... I think that maybe that there was a part of me that felt like I could, I could shape him and he wasn't opposed to the church in the way that my dad was. So there was a future for us. It seemed like a step up. <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. In the religion ways. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. Um, 
What was your What was your testimony like in high school? I'm assuming you went to release time seminary. I did in your high school. I what did. What was your developing faith like? Was it Bruce R. McConkie like Mormonism? Was it Was it you know Was doctrine important to you? Were scriptures important to you? What was your prayer life like? All that. Okay, so I think where I didn't grow up in a home that was immersed in doctrine, I was getting all of my doctrine from church. And occasionally when I decided to from general conference. So in a way I wasn't indoctrinated in the same way that families are that have, um, you know, your family home evening that are doing the ABC and D. I didn't really have that. I was dependent on Sundays to get my doctrine. Um, but as far as my, my prayer life and my, my, I developed a really strong connection with the idea of God just because of the, um, the dissonance that I experienced all the time, I was always trying to turn to some, somewhere for comfort. And so um, I had a, a relationship with, with God that I, and that was kind of something I felt like was getting me through those years. Um, so I didn't identify. And this did, may have, how did God help you? Um, how did a belief in God help you? I think that prayer... Um, I, I think it was just comforting. It was comforting to feel like there was a source, there was something there that could see what was happening in my life and in my home. Um, and, but, but still kind of was there, like just, just the, believing that there was something that was there that could see the pain, could, that could see each one of us and believe that it knew um, what was going on with my dad, what was going on with me, with my mom, that could see all the pain. Um, but could stay constant and be there and love all of us. So I clung to that a lot. So, so a lot of prayer? Mm -hmm, prayer. Did you feel like he answered your prayers? Uh, um, sometimes, yes. Yeah, I felt like there was a time or two where I had, you know, those strong spiritual experiences. Um, and I don't know that I necessarily, <clears throat> I don't know how I feel about those now. I'm still sorting some of those things out, but, um, but I did feel comforted. Yeah. I did feel comforted by, by going that route. And I was, you know, and I was also being promised at church if I did go that route that, you know, that was kind of reinforcement for the God belief. Um, but being able to separate God from religion for me was really, really important later on yeah. that I had that kind of an early age. I'm just thinking to a kid who's got so much tension in the home and a dad, she feels mixed things about to have this all powerful, mm -hmm. all loving, unconditionally loving heavenly father. Yeah. It's always there to support you and encourage you and to lead you on and yeah. to listen to you mm -hmm. and to help you whenever you need it. That's how is that not in many ways a very healing and a, and a empowering thing? Yeah. Yeah, it was super empowering. And it's really, I know a lot of people uh, who have daddy issues have a hard time believing in God, you know, Heavenly Father, because their own father wasn't those things. But it does show that my dad did a good job in a lot of ways. Like he was a good dad and is a good dad. Um, gosh, I hate being so emotional. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, definitely was able to retain a, a feeling that God was there. Um, a lot of good, um, good feelings as far as believing that God was there, but the doctrine, um, like the church being true and the book of Mormon being true, those sorts of things. I swallowed all of that. Just, what do you mean? I mean, I, I believed it. Um, I didn't really study the scriptures a lot as a kid, but, um, like I, I said, I did go through primary. I went all the way through church, young women's program. I did seminary, um, so I did study the scriptures as much as I had to. I don't think that back then we were required to read the scriptures in the way that they require now in seminary. So I got through it um, and I, I picked up plenty of do doctrine along the way. Um, and, I, and I swallowed it all. I, I did believe it all. Mm -hmm. Though I think that early on, I, um, because of my dad, I had a more um, ingrained nature of asking why. The why it, was, it felt a lot more normal for me to ask why and to question and that that was okay because my, my dad did it. So I was able to see both sides of, um, you know, being in or being out. 
-hmm. I knew what that looked like for people um, because I lived it. I was, you know, I, I lived it. That's, that was my life. I grew up in that, you know, seeing what it looks like for people and loving people. I think that's the important part is loving my dad and seeing what it was like for him, loving my mom, seeing what it was like for her. It gave me a really, I feel like now a very unique perspective just because my family was not a stalwart. They were not devout. And that perspective is what? Um, I think it served me well later on working for the church because I was able to reach a broader audience. You had empathy for mm -hmm. all types of mm -hmm. people. And I was families. able to write for, for everyone. Yeah. So, how did you handle repentance with your bishop oh. and the law of chastity? Because you were, you mm -hmm. guys, for those who aren't Mormon, law of chastity is the law that basically says no sexual relations at all of any sort before marriage. Yeah. You guys, you, you've been vulnerable and honest enough to mm -hmm. admit you guys were sexually active, which I don't think is unheard of within, oh. <laughs> the Mormon, within Utah County Mormonism. <laughs> Or any type of Mormonism or anywhere in the world. But yeah. but we're, we're taught as Mormons that if, if you're a teenager and you sin, mm -hmm. I'm saying that in air quotes for those listening, <laughs> then you have to go repent to your bishop. Right. So how did you handle that? Well, where we married civilly right out of, um, right out of high school. Um, even before, even in high school. I do remember going to a bishop once um, and confessing. Um, my mom drove me to this appointment, which was really interesting to think back on too, because she's like, why, why do you need to go? You know, why, why do you need to go and talk to the bishop? Why, you know, and I said, mom, I've just done some things that I need to, I need to clear up. I need to talk about. And she is so interesting now looking back. You don't need to do this. She said that? You don't need to do this. She you said, don't need to talk mm -hmm. to him. She says, you don't need to do this. He doesn't need to know. Go, grandma. He, he got go, grandma. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't need to know. And she says, you really, really don't need to do this. But I was wow. insistent that I, I needed to go in. I remember sitting in the car with her before I walked inside. Wow. How old were you? Uh, I was, I had to have been 17 or 18. That's yeah. incredible. Wow. Yeah. So she was telling me, no, don't, don't do it. Why'd you do it anyway? Why did you feel like you needed to do it anyway? I'd been told I needed to do it. And I felt, and I did feel shame. I felt ashamed and I understood the repentance process and I believed in it and I had faith in it and I did connect it enough with God that I wanted to be right with God. That was really, really a motivating factor for me just because I felt close to God. I didn't want God to have anything that he was upset with me for. So yes, even if it was hard, I was going to do it. I did. I went in and sat down with that bishop who I barely knew because we weren't super active. So that was a little bit difficult. Were you alone? Alone. You were yes. old? Uh, 17, maybe 17 year old woman with mm -hmm. the bishop. Yeah. Okay. 16 or 17. Doors. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I think it was on a weekday. I think, I don't think that there was really even anybody else in, in the building. And I don't remember if my mom waited for me. I assume she did, but I was within walking distance of the church. So I don't really remember that part, but I do remember the conversation before going in. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he did ask detailed questions. He wanted to know, you know, and I just said, you know, I just, um, I, I don't remember. Um, I do remember, I naturally remember being uncomfortable with what he asked, but he, and he did what ask types for, of detailed questions that you probably won't remember perfectly. But. Um, he wanted to know specifically what, you know, what sexual acts, you know, that we had, we had done. Um, and I, I told him as much as I felt comfortable, um, and until he kind of was, was seemed satisfied. And uh, I do remember him giving me the miracle of forgiveness <laughs> that was handed to me <laughs> and I did take it home and I, I spent some time reading it. Um, so yeah, more shame, more shame there. And did you read that book? And, and, and a lot of our, a lot of our listeners won't, you know, we did a, we did an episode. I did an episode on the miracle of forgiveness mm -hmm. and, and the teachings in it. Do you want to, for those who have never been Mormon or haven't read the book, do, do you remember anything I, from the book? I don't remember a lot of details of it. Or even I just, I just perused it. It just. Um, I'll just I'll, I'll, can I jump in? Yeah, uh, please. It, it basically says that hmm. having any sexual having extramarital sexual relations is next to murder in severity. It also <laughs> says that you know b being gay is caused by masturbating. It oh, says gosh. that being gay is an abomination, is disgusting and revolting. Like yeah. 
it, but 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 for a kid in your situation, it basically says that you're there's like murder, <laughs> and then like right under that is what you and your you is, is you murderers, <laughs> and then right under there is Linda. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Her boyfriend. So clearly I didn't read all the book and I didn't absorb it because <laughs> I didn't remember all of those details. I just thought, okay, I did my job. I went in and I confessed and I did what I was supposed to do. And then I got back on my, it's me and you God bandwagon. You know, I did, that was, I checked that off of my list. And as I'm thinking about it now, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, the timeline is not right for that interview. Cause that interview was younger. That was not, I was not confessing things. Um, with my husband on that, that interview, that was actually a little bit younger. And I'd done something with a different boy, not sex, not full on sex, but there was some petting that had happened that I had felt guilty about. So I'm like that, that was that interview because confessing what I did with my husband, um, came, uh, at least a year and a half, two years into our marriage. So you didn't tell the mm -mm. bishop at the no, time. No, there was no reason we were getting married civilly. We, no, I mean, in oh, that interview that in your that mom interview. told you not to go into, you I did tell, I did tell what I had done. Everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I did. And yeah. did the bishop help you? No. Did make it better? No, uh, no. I didn't feel like it was better at all. How did I, he leave it with you? Um, from what I remember, you know, he's like, you know, well, thank you. know, basically thank you for coming in. You've done, you know, you've, you've done the first step going over the, f the four steps of repentance, you know, which was, I, I'm trying to remember if it was, you know, acknowledge the sin, Confess um, it, confess forsake it, it, forsake it and never do it again. Do it again. And I didn't <laughs> do so great with it. I'll do it again. <laughs> I was a human being with feelings and emotions and drives. So, um, so yeah. So I, I, I feel like I left that with, okay, I checked it off. I checked off. I did what I was supposed to do. Okay. So you didn't feel horrible though. It didn't no. make you feel horrible. No. Okay, good. No, I don't remember feeling horrible. I, I remember feeling very, very uncomfortable yeah. during that interview, but not, I don't remember feeling a, a additional shame more, any more than I already felt. Did you leave wishing you had listened to your mom or, or were you, <laughs> no, you said you felt glad you did it. Yeah. I was the, I was the driving force for that. I was all me. That was, I, I should have listened to my mom. <laughs> How many times does a kid grow up saying that? Uh, <laughs> you hear that, Savannah? Uh, every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> super awful. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, yeah. Let's see. Where do we go from here? Um, yeah, that was the only... Uh, I've only had a couple of confession interviews. So, but. so you, by the time you graduate from high school, what's life looking like? What are your goals? What are your, you know... Oh man. Okay. So I grew up with not a super uh, strong self-esteem and kind of being maybe not verbally told, but just, um, kind of treated like my capacity was a mother that I didn't necessarily have the intellectual capacity. I followed, uh, uh, this 4.0 awesome academically inclined sister. And so I always grew up kind of feeling a little bit inferior to her. And so I was kind of treated, you know, like, pat on the head, you're going to be a great mom, you know? <laughs> and so I didn't really believe that there was a lot, uh, out there for me other than motherhood. So I remember sitting in high school and having, um, kind of one of those interviews with the counselor where you're talking about college and your future and, and him saying, okay, so, you know, what college do you want to go to? What are you thinking you want to do? And I was like, um, I think I'm just going to be a beautician. And he was like, what? you know, no, 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 don't, don't just settle for that. You, you can do, you can do more. And I was like, no, 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 no. And I, I was like, oh my gosh, she's going to find out that I'm stupid. I just, no, I mean, no, I'm just, I just need to be, <laughs> I just need to be a hairstylist. That's what I'm going to do. And so he couldn't, he couldn't even talk me out of like this plan, this plan. I, I just needed to be a mom that was safe. That was what I had capacity for. So just, I grew up with kind of a low self-esteem. And part of that was just following a, 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 a really academically amazing sister. And then just, um, uh, intelligence was really, really encouraged and, um, praised in my home. And I was praised for how well I did my hair. So <laughs> that's what I was going to be. So I was going to be a mom that just looked cute. I was going to be your typical Mormon mommy. <laughs> All these years later, you're on camera and your hair looks fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> and all paid off and interviewed. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
So yeah, that was, that was my agenda. I was going to go to beauty school. Um, parents paid for, um, they, they had us pay for all of it. And then to encourage me to finish, they said that they would reimburse half of it when I was done. So I finished beauty school in a year and went to work. So my husband, um, headed to college. He, um, went to UVU and kind of was following in my father's footsteps, which was really interesting in construction management. Um, so he went to a couple of years of college and kind of felt like, Hey, I'm already doing everything I'm going to college for. And he didn't finish, but he's still working in that field and being very successful in that field. So that's, that's where we, um, that was our plan. And as far as, um, temple marriage, yeah, I started to push for that, uh, you know, pretty quickly into our marriage. We were married for two years, I think. Tell tell our listeners what it's like in the heart of Mormonism. I sometimes call, I guess Utah County isn't the equivalent of Saudi Arabian Mormonism because that's Rexburg. <laughs> yeah. But Utah County, next to Rexburg, Idaho, mm -hmm. I think Utah County is known as being one of the most orthodox yeah. centers of Mormonism. Yeah. What's it like to grow up in one of the most conservative counties in all of Orthodox Mormonism? but to get married, not in the temple, to get married in a civil ceremony. Yeah. Tell us what that's like and what, what that communicates to all, every, all your neighbors, everyone around you, everyone you grew up with. Can you talk us through that? Because I don't think that's something we've really covered. And I don't think people understand when we say, oh, I got married civilly in the heart of Mormonism. <laughs> What that, what that, what that, what that's really about. Can you, yeah. can you fill all that in? It's a scarlet letter. <laughs> yeah. t t take us all the way through that. Okay. Even if you want to start with doctrine or whatever. Or sure. Out. Well, um, everybody, everybody knows that if you are not getting, getting married in the temple and you're getting married that young, your spouse is not, your, your fiance is not serving an LDS mission. You have sinned. Obviously Maybe. everybody knows you've had sex. Okay. You know, that's, um, and I don't know that we really tried to deny that nobody asked us. It's very passive aggressive. Nobody flat out asked us, um, if we'd had sex, but the next question you get to kind of get around and figure that out, you know, to figure out if somebody's getting married in the temple or not, which is, have you had sex or not? Are you a sinner or not? That's <laughs> what that question is. Um, I had, I went to a high school football game right after we graduated. So this was a football game that was, um, you know, with the, the year younger than us. And one of my friends was there that had, uh, you know, graduated with our class, my class, my husband's class. And he's like, he's like, so I heard you're getting married. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, so temple, you get married in the temple. And I was like, it's like, no. And he's, he just looked at me like right in the eyes. He says, I am so disappointed in you, you know, and I'll never forget that. That's, that was painful. You know, what was that? What did, what did you feel? I, um, just, it was just confirmation of the worries, you know, that you have all those worries. Like, what is everybody thinking about me? You know, what does everybody really think? And it was just confirmation that yes, everybody is thinking that everybody is thinking you're a sinner, that you're not worthy, um, that you're a second class citizen. Um, and that was really hard. Um, but I was very much in love and we had a wonderful relationship, you know, so it, people couldn't be happy for me. And that was, that was really hard. Um, I had another, another young man at church because I clearly, I have a memory of being at church after I was engaged. So I, even if we were sitting, I had still trying to attend church and I don't really remember details about what most of that was like, but it like, but I do remember an interaction with another young man that was also my age that had graduated with our class and a couple of girls that were close to my age where had come up and were like looking at my ring. I said, Oh my gosh, I can't believe you're engaged. They were, you know, they were, they were being kind, probably trying to get information too. I don't know. Uh, but he walked up to me and he looked again, looked, looked straight at me and said, I bet if you took that ring off your finger, he'd go on a mission. What does that mean? Uh, that means that it was my fault that my husband was choosing to not serve an LDS mission that I was, um, he was putting all the blame on me that you were a what? That I was a sinner, that I was, a I was a temptress, that right. it was, it was on me. That's um, like, that was it? really painful as well. That hurt. That was another confirmation that I was less than, you know, which I'd grown up with anyway, a little bit from everybody in Utah County. You know, when you're not the active family, 
everybody knows, you know, everybody, you're always being, trying to be, people are always trying to fellowship you. They're always trying to invite you to church, which with me, they were pretty successful with, but not with all of my family. But so, yeah, those are two of the, the, um, the most painful things I had just from peers that, you know, that's just a, a just kind of a taste of what it felt like. That's all really interesting because I grew up in Provo okay. and those are all the things that I wanted to avoid. So I feel a lot of parallels to that yeah. of I did get married in the temple at 19 because I didn't want people to say those things about me. Right. It's very realis- That's It's a very realistic um, right. reason that you you covenant, you go through this temple ceremony, you do all these things. A lot of this, yes, so that you can have a relationship with God and make these covenants that you've always been waiting to make. Yeah. And you you assume that you're going to, you know, fulfill this potential by getting married in the temple. But a lot of it is because you don't want people to talk crap about you. <laughs> Let's yeah. be realistic. It's that's yeah. really painful to hear. And that's that's something that I wanted to avoid. And if yeah. you if you didn't care what people thought, yeah, my life might have been different. <laughs> and and if, I, if, if it's OK, I just want to. I just want to note a few things. I've been okay. I've been studying a lot about undue influence. We're about to release an episode on Mormon stories about the ways that unhealthy organizations wield undue influence. Mm-hmm. So Luna Lindsay Corbin's book called Recovering Agency talks about this a lot. It's basically techniques that unhealthy organizations, high demand religions, and or cults use. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to just call out two things at least about your experience. Mm-hmm. One is how central shame is. Um, yeah. to the business model or the theological model of many high demand religions, because it, it it's the axle that so much wraps around. If you can get people feeling awful about themselves, get them feeling like they're unworthy, mm-hmm. then they need the church and Jesus and God to feel worthy. Yeah. And they've got you chained to them. If they can make you feel a ton of shame. There's a secondary benefit to that too, in that in that um, having the temple as something where there's restricted access to, unless you're worthy, mm-hmm. um, and then tying the payment of tithing and social reputation. Yeah, social reputation to, cannot to, be understated. Like yeah. it's so important. Tying tying tithing and social reputation to temple worthiness ensures that people are living not not just living the way the church wants but giving money to the church because you can't be temple worthy without paying tithing and so this is all so inextricably linked it's why we always come back to law of chastity within mormonism yes. because it's the way they get everybody shame. in line shame <laughs> is the way they get everybody in line to feel dependent on the church mm-hmm. and then to give the church its its lives their lives mm-hmm. and their money and i don't I don't think it's intentionally nefarious. I think this is a system right. that got set up really early that everyone in the system is a victim of. There's one other thing I just want to note, and that's there's this awful irony because there were thousands of Mormon couples your age all over the world that were also sexually active prior to marriage, mm-hmm. but they just lied. Yeah. They just lied. They got all the benefits of a temple marriage, no scarlet letter. So they were they were taught to lie and and they were rewarded for lying. Yeah. So in a weird way, the the less valiant, the less faithful, the less honest get rewarded. Get elevated. And yeah. then sometimes <laughs> and then sometimes the most honest and in some ways, the most righteous, the ones that said, no, I, I'm not worthy. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to just do the honorable thing and wear the scarlet letter instead of lie. It's the it's sometimes the honest people that get punished. Yeah. <laughs> Are you saying religion is sometimes performative, John? <laughs> Are well, we breaking new ground here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying yeah. I, I, we grow up thinking who is a Mormon. We grow up. Well, they're good and they're bad. Yeah. Oh, these black people and white. did the right, and these people were bad. But it's it, it's it's often way more complicated right. than that. Right. And I remember shortly after we were married, we had some we had some super close friends who did it the right way. Um, and I didn't know. You're saying that in quotes. Or? I'm saying they had the right way. <laughs> I didn't know that they had also been sexually active before they got married. I didn't know. Like, and I, I was I always had this less than complex around her. 
Um, and I would, I tended to talk about it. She was a safe space for me. So I would talk about, you know, that we had had sex before we were married. And one day, <laughs> I'll never forget this too, because she must have gotten just annoyed with me because she's like, oh my gosh, we did too. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I was, it, I was like, what you did too. And she, and I, in a way it was harder for her too, because they were going to almost, they were going to weekly, like weekly and monthly bishops interviews, confessing and confessing if they couldn't keep their hands off each other. <laughs> you know, <laughs> They were doing the same things that we were doing, but they were, they weren't willing to get married civilly first. They couldn't, the pressures were too strong in their family to do it the way that we had done it. Uh, so they suffered for a full year, you know, with, it's just hard to even be around each other. Like for them, it was hard to even be around each other, you know, cause they were so afraid they were going to mess up and have to confess again. So that shame for them having to relive it over and over and over again, month after month, you know, for a year, cause they would mess up, you know, so that, that I, that made me feel so much better to know that she had two, that I had somebody that I knew that had done what I had done, you know, but had just kind of chosen a different avenue, you know, because of the pressures in her family, her family was very religious. And so she didn't feel like that was, she didn't want to get married civilly first. Yeah. Three principles uh, that we're outlining here are a culture of, of purity. Mm -hmm. Purity culture is one tool of undue influence. Mm -hmm. um, a, a second is confession. Yeah. You know, Scientology uses it brilliantly. Uh, confession is a, is a tool of undue influence. Purity culture, confession, and then milieu control. Oh no, shame, shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. That's a third, shame and guilt. And then a fourth is milieu control, which is where the, the social culture is used to control people, even beyond what the church itself is, is, explicitly and overtly controlling. And it sounds like all four of those really worked. Oh yeah. 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 And the social, I think the social aspect was pretty, that was the, one of the hardest parts for me. Um, I, I know that my grandma was probably disappointed in me. Um, but she couldn't say anything either. She was married at 17. <laughs> so I had a lot of, um, high school sweetheart, you know, stories in my life. So that part wasn't a big deal. Getting married young for me, you know, and being married civilly first, that really wasn't, I, I didn't, th nobody could back that up and say, you need to do it the way that I did it because <laughs> everybody was doing it the way that, you know, yeah. not the right way. So, so that made it easier for me, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of social pressures leading up to our actual marriage. Yeah. It was difficult. So what type of wife and mom does that make you, uh, <laughs> once you've been through the, the shame parade as we call it? Ah. <sighs> What kind of a wife and mother did it make me? <laughs> um, From a religious standpoint. What kind of a mother was I? <laughs> Maybe we can go there. I, well, what did you want? What, what, you know, cause, cause at least I, I, I get the sense that even though you didn't start out your marriage in the perfect way, mm -hmm. you probably said, well, now I can create the family that, yeah. that, that the good family, I yeah. can now create the good family. I is that, knew, is that right? Yes, yes. I knew it was going to take some time for people to accept me, people that knew me, but I could move out of my ward and my husband could move out of his ward and we could start fresh where nobody really knew us um, and and be the, the perfect Mormons. I don't know that I ever felt like I was going to be a perfect Mormon. Um, but, but yeah, we could do things right and we could be accepted in our, in our culture, in our, in our, society. Um, and it's interesting though, because we didn't end up being super active right off the bat. We didn't. And maybe that was the shame. Maybe that was, um, it took some time to feel like we were ready to go and be in those surroundings. Maybe worthy. Yeah. Maybe you didn't feel worthy. I, I know I didn't. It was hard. And I remember when we were starting to think about getting inactive, uh, getting active, um, because we were inactive. Um, we did try to go to church one week and um, to introduce yourself at uh, in a Mormon, new Mormon congregation is always, it's a little bit draining. Uh, you, every meeting that you walk into, Oh, who are you? Tell us your story. Tell us all about you. And 
So I remember going to a Springville ward. We moved to Springville during the, the second year that we were married. I don't think that we went at all during our first year. Well, maybe we might have a little bit, but we started to try to get a little bit active our second year of marriage. And so going to church the first time in this new ward in Springville, um, I had a girl turn around to me in Relief Society and her was a question to me wasn't, you know, what's your name? How are you? You know, it wasn't any of that. It was like, what temple did you get married in? That was the first question that came out of her mouth. And I drew a blank. I'm like, oh, crap. You know, I hadn't been sealed yet. I did not know how to answer this girl. And I was like, oh, we were married in Spanish Fork. We were married at, you know, the Shalon Reception Center. <laughs> In Spanish Fork. And what was that like for you? Well, the look on her face was like, it, the response is what killed me because that was not what she was expecting. And it was like, oh, and she had to turn around to talk to me. And she turned right back around and never spoke to me again. And so I, <laughs> you remember those moments. It's like, okay, this is going to be harder than I thought to reintegrate myself into this culture. And I just wanted, I mean, I thought afterward, I thought, why didn't I say, Oh, Spanish Fork Temple. You haven't heard of that one. <laughs> you know, I've thought many times what I should have said, but she wasn't really interested in talking to me or she had gotten too uncomfortable in that moment to, you know, to know what to say to me, you know, what else could she say to yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. She, I don't think that she, I think it was more, she was shocked by my answer and just uncomfortable and didn't know how to, yeah. Oh, you're a sinner. Oh, Scarlet letter. I don't know what she thought. Mm -hmm. But she didn't talk to me again, wasn't comfortable speaking to me. And it was, um, it was tough. We, we, it was really difficult for us to integrate ourselves into the ward. So we did have uh, uh, home teachers. I remember them coming to visit us um, and feeling talked down to. What do you mean? Um, so? it, where we weren't super active, they knew we weren't active it, because it was being difficult to integrate ourselves into the culture, into the ward. When they would come to visit, they just wa walked in with, uh, there was a holier than thou feeling that came with them. You know, they they come into our house, sit on our couch and are, I felt, I felt kind of talked down to, like they had all the answers. They did everything right. We were, I just felt less than I felt like I felt that second class citizen feeling a lot. Um, and after they left feeling kind of relieved that it was just my husband and I again, <laughs> So my husband was my safe space. We were each other's safe space. Um, so that's a, that's a positive. That right? was a positive. We had each other um, and we weren't, we knew we weren't bad people. <laughs> that's good. So anyway, um, we were less close with my husband's family during that time, closer to mine. And that makes a lot of sense just with where we were in the way that we chose to do things. Um, so yeah. So a lot of those experiences early in our marriage, hard to reintegrate. Um, we finally went, we did get sealed eventually. Um, that was in the year 2000. So we got married in 97 and we got sealed in St. George in the year 2000. And what was that process like? Okay, so. What's the mindset? Kind of interesting for me because. Because you've already been married. So explain to like non-Mormons why you would need to get married again. Okay. Well, our, our salvation was on the line. Why? That's the, that's the Mormon teaching. You have to be married in the temple. You have to, um, yeah, we, you have to, you have to be sealed in the temple or, or you won't be able to go to the celestial kingdom and live with God. And for me living with God, that was a big deal. Like I felt pretty strong about God. So if you didn't get married in the temple, what would happen? And I wouldn't be able to be with my husband forever. That was or your kids or my kids, which we didn't have kids for four years. So, which surprised a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Where was that pregnancy baby? <laughs> so funny. You got married, huh? So funny. We ran into an old girlfriend of my husband's, um, like two, after we had her, it was after we had her and we're walking through a blockbuster looking for a movie that shows how old I am. Um, and she was, she came up and was talking to us a little bit and she's like, don't you have one that's older than her? <laughs> I was like, nope. whoa, that shows exactly what you thought, you know, that we, that we'd had to get, had to get married because I was pregnant. And I was like, no, she's our oldest, you know, and we let, we let it be at that. 
But um, yeah, so we had experiences like that even way later on, you know, after we were already integrated. Come on, it haunts you a little bit. <laughs> but um, and just going by, I'm, I'm for, we have so many non-Mormon listeners now uh, that I just have to make this really explicit yeah. that if we're talking about um, undue influence, one of the Mormon teachings is that if you don't get married in a Mormon temple to your spouse, sealed in the Mormon temple, then you can't go to the highest degree of heaven, which is the celestial kingdom, where you can become a god someday, but also where you get to live with God, and you get to live with your spouse forever, and you get to live with your kids forever, and your parents and all the good Mormons, they're all in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, and temple marriage is a requirement for all that. If you don't get sealed in the temple, which is not just un unrighteous Mormons, but all the rest of the world, all of you... <laughs> right and all of the people who aren't faithful mormons don't get to live with heavenly father in heaven for eternity don't get to live with their spouses in heaven for eternity don't get to live with their children for eternity it's like you're alone in some other place in heaven which kind of is hell for eternity yeah and and again paying money to the church and obeying the church is all wrapped in with temple worthiness or temple attendance. And so there's a lot at stake. Hold on. Is, is that, is that why you, partly why you wanted to get that's, married Of temple? course, that's all, that's the whole reason I wanted to go, you know, it just the forever family. I remember as a kid singing, you know, that I loved that song, you know, I have, you know, I have a family here on earth. They are so good to me. You know, um, I want to share my, I want to share my life with them for all eternity. Families can be together forever. Families can be together forever. So yeah, that, that I loved that song. I worried as a kid when I heard that song and it was always my dad. Yeah. So always worried about losing dad, not being with dad. And then, you know, so of course I was going to go through with the temple. You know, I was going to make sure that those, those family relationships were sure. It, um, yeah, there's, I was definitely going to do that. I had to do that. You know, with that belief system, I had to do that to have my family with me. So, um, so yeah, so 2000, year 2000, the, the situation on this is interesting. And I wanted to talk really quickly about, um, a conversation that I had with my dad. So by the year 2000, my husband and I had moved down to St. George. We're living in, in hurricane for just a little while. He was working for, um, WW Clyde with his family, um, with his dad on a, on a project down there. So he and I were invited just to live down there for about nine months while this project was going on. While we were down there, I think that I felt safe enough being away from my dad to pursue the temple without too much conflict. I think this was also kind of a subconscious thing. So we were away from Utah County. I mean, not that St. George is a lot different, but it was our own space where we could pursue the temple and I wouldn't have to worry about the conflict with my dad. So, um, but one, one weekend I was up, we were up visiting and my dad had me alone in the kitchen and he, he knew that we were doing the temple prep classes down there. And he, he said, I just want you to know, you don't have to do this. You know, you don't have to do this. And I, again, the cognitive dissonance was so hard because I just, I said, okay, dad, you know, okay. I just, I felt it, it felt confrontational, but it wasn't. He was coming from a place of love, but I couldn't see it. Why do you think he would have? How how could that have been a loving message from his perspective? I'm just curious what you think. Well, looking back on it now, I know that that he was seeing. He just he had just had such a broader perspective than I did. Which, which was you know just that it, it you know the temple isn't necessary you know for happiness to have a, a you know a good life and a good marriage. And it's not necessary. He was seeing all of those things, but I couldn't see it. I was so, so wrapped up in it that I, that was not even on my radar. And so when he brought it up, it felt like conflict immediately. I was back in that space of being a child, you know, not knowing how to handle my dad and, and the feelings of like, but I have to do this. This is right. Um, so I just kind of was very passive in that moment and just said, Hey dad, you know, okay, I, you know, I understand. But the second that that conversation was over, I was in my car, beelining it back to St. George. 
I was, and my husband was still in St. George. So I was visiting alone that weekend and I cried the whole way <laughs> back to St. George because, because the cognitive dissonance was so difficult, you know, um, and, and just wanting to have that relationship with my dad, wanting my dad to feel happy for me, you know, that I was getting to the point where I was, I was worthy, you know, that I was taking the steps to be, you know, to do what I was supposed to do. I just couldn't connect with him. So it was a combination of just not being able to connect with him, the, the pain of that, and then just all of the religious stuff on top of it was really overwhelming. So I got home, you know, to St. George and talked to my husband about it. And I, um, but I'll never forget that too, because it was such an emotionally charged thing. My mom got home and she talked to my dad. She's like, what did you do? <laughs> Cause I was gone. I was supposed to stay for another night or two. And I was like, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't do it. Um, yeah. So, um, I had asked my dad if he would be there, if he would come to the temple, which gosh, I feel so bad. I feel so bad about that now because the hoops that my dad had to jump through to be in that temple with my husband and I in St. George, when we, the day of, when we finally decided to do it, I know that he was meeting with the bishop constantly, you know, and, and I'm sure he was discussing all of his issues with the church, but, um, giving, I'm sure he gave, <laughs> I'm sure he gave that Bishop hell, honestly, because I'm sure that he was playing the card. I need to be there for my daughter. My daughter has asked me to be there and you're the only thing between me and my daughter right now. And you know, I, and I think, I, I, I think we need to back up just a tiny Kay. bit for non-Mormons and just, Kay. I I can hear a non-Mormon saying, wait, why wait, is what? the dad not <laughs> attending the wedding of his own daughter? Yeah. Explain Explain that. Okay, in, in so Mormonism. dad was not being an active, he was not doing A, B, C, and D. He wasn't towing the line. He wasn't being obedient. Meaning what? Uh, going to church, attending the temple, paying his tithing, doing all, all of the things that are required to attend the LDS temple. He had to do all of those things to attend the temple. For somebody who doesn't believe it, uh, to jump through those hoops is is asking way, way too much. You know, and so... So he was set... Your, yeah. Just to be clear, your parent was set to not be not being able to attend your wedding. Yes. Your, your temple. Our temple wedding. Temple wedding. He did get to walk me down through the aisle, down the aisle when we did our civil ceremony. So, and he was very grateful for that experience. But in in the temple, my dad wouldn't play any role in the experience, or even be able to attend, or even be able. And, to, and again, we have to go back to the Scarlet Letter. Right. Explain what it might be like for a parent. Okay. For my dad, excruciating to not be able to excruciating what, why? to not be a, a, at a wedding of his child to sit outside and be shamed, you know, uh, to not, to not be able to be in there and observe that special ceremony well, with that, neighbors and strangers. Oh, and everybody. Yeah. Everybody that knows him, you know, it's a scarlet letter for him to not be there, you know? So um, I know that that was a very difficult thing. I know that he, he went through multiple bishops interviews. Um, and I'm sure he, gave, like I said, I'm sure he gave the bishop hell cause my dad is pretty blunt and pretty straightforward. Um, somehow I don't know how, and I've never talked to my dad about the details of how he was able to do it, but he did it. He got a temple recommend. He probably had to pay tithing. I don't know what he yeah. had. Sometimes I mean, people have to pay back tithing for all the years yeah. that they didn't pay tithing. Sometimes yeah. they have to say a lot of personal things to a stranger. Yeah. And sometimes they have to either manufacture a genuine belief yeah. or deceive about their beliefs. Yeah. And I'm sure my dad wouldn't test. lie. But it's all shame parade stuff. It's mm -hmm. all shame and get in line. Yeah. And it's it ends up being behavioral control and yeah. Pay us money. That, and that's underwear how it control ends up too, being. right? What's that? And, and underwear, underwear control, control right? Like, <laughs> yes. wouldn't he have had to like go to the distribution center literally and start? He his probably garments? did. Because if you don't oh wear your gosh. Mormon garments, your Mormon underwear, you also can't attend the temple. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not just A B C D. It's E F G H I J K L. <laughs> yeah. It's a powerful mechanism of all the things. Control. All the things, and I'm sure that if I really had to hear the details of the hoops my dad had to jump through to be. A, at my wedding on that day, my temple ceremony on that day, um, it would break my heart to really hear what he had to do, but he did it for me. Mm. He was there. And the saddest thing ever is, is that day, um, 
being in the temple with my dad. <laughs> He's such a shit. Sorry. <laughs> The, that he couldn't, he couldn't be reverent. He was not, he, he didn't love being there. He was more interested in, um, in checking out the historicity of the temple. Like he was, he was kind of trying to sneak off into hidden rooms. <laughs> he was snooping. You know, he, he came in, he was, he made it through into the celestial room and all of that. Uh, he was, you know, I think so it was maybe, oh, he was the endowment day. So we did endowment one day and then we did the temple ceremony the next day. But on the day of the endowment, when he was there for that as well, and he kept trying to kind of sneak off and check out the Do we have the, the same dad? That is so weird. <laughs> like that's literally word for word, exactly what my dad did. Too. Yeah. <laughs> it was very He's interesting. Making kind of a joke about it. In the building, because it's one of the oldest Mormon Mormon temples is St. George. So he was pretty interested in, in the building. And I remember being kind of upset with him that he was not focused. Come on, dad, focus. I so, wonder if yeah. he was a tiny bit resentful oh, of what he had to do to get oh, there. Absolutely. I'm sure. There's no doubt that he was resentful. Um, and my grandma, who was also there, the really re religious grandma, she was there too. So the other memory of that temple ceremony day was her, once we're all in the celestial room, her throwing her arms open. Now we can all be together forever. Cause my dad was there too. And that was huge for her. I mean, this, this is his mom. This is actually my maternal grandmother. Your mom's mom. Yes. Was but there was saying. a lot of conflict between my dad and my grandma because they're polar opposites on the religious spectrum. Yeah. So for my dad to be there. Um, it, my grandma was having this emotional response in the temple, in the, in the celestial room. And she spiked the spiritual football. <laughs> yeah. right. And I remember being a little bit embarrassed by how she was, uh, how she was acting. I was like, oh, grandma, I don't think he's quite there, you know, in that space, but he's here. Let's just, you know, anyway, so. What was the actual endowment ceremony like for you? It, it, Okay. Was it awesome or was it problematic in any way? A lot of our interviewees had a difficult time going through the Mormon temple themselves prior to the wedding. Because for, for non-Mormon listeners, there's an endowment ceremony that you go through before you get married in the temple um, where, you, where you are given the garments to wear, this underwear that you're supposed to wear as a Mormon. But also you make all these covenants to the church to give your time, your life, your money, everything to the church for the, for eternity. Yeah. And then, and then there's a movie you watch and it, you know, yeah. um, what was, was that at all? And it's all borrowed from the Masonic lodge. So if you go back in time, Joseph Smith was a Mason for a short period of time. And he basically just ripped off a bunch of rituals from the Masonic ceremony, Stuck lunged it with Genesis <laughs> yeah. and created, um, a, a Mormon temple ceremony. So what was it like for you, that endowment? Okay. It yeah. It was great. I, I didn't have a lot of problems with it. There were, I mean, uh, thinking back, there were a couple of things that that were notable in my head. I knew that I was driving the religion bus in our relationship. And so when they said that I would answer to my husband as my husband answers to God, I was like, dude, how's your relationship with God? Because me and God are pretty tight. Are you sure? You know, like, I mean, not you, that my husband the woman, didn't. The but. woman covenanted to hearken to the, her husband while her husband covenanted yeah. to hearken to God. Yeah. So this is something that they just recently changed because of internet activism, frankly. Yeah. But for, for oh, almost two centuries, the man covenanted with God and the woman covenanted with her husband. Yeah. With a veil over her face. Is, yes. it, is that all right? Yeah. And that you was, noticed that? Part? I did notice that. I did notice that because I thought that that was strange. I knew that I, w I just by nature had, I was more spiritual spiritually inclined and that I prayed a lot more and that I was, I mean, cause we'd been married for two years at that point. I knew I prayed more than my husband, at least like visually. I mean, you could see me kneel down and pray. I knew, I mean, I, I not that he didn't pray. I mean, I feel like my husband had a good handle on, you know, his spirituality too, but, um, I, 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 I'm going to be a little bit arrogant and say that I felt like I was, I was more spiritual than my husband was. So I thought that that, that felt strange that felt odd that I was going to answer to my husband as he answers to God, because I'm like, I have my own relationship with God that just felt weird. Mm -hmm. So that was the only part that I, and the handshakes were all strange. Like that was all really weird. And I thought for me, I was very much like, I wonder what it means. 
it's, I just need to keep coming so I understand what all these handshakes mean because they have to have this meaning. Where can I learn more about the meaning? It was kind of unexpected, um, but I just, I was really into symbolism and spirituality. So I was like, okay, there's got to be something yeah, that's got to mean something. So for me, I was like, okay, I guess I just have to come more. But it, I, I wasn't super weirded out by it. Oh, other other notable thing was, um, you know, raising my hands to the air. The true order of prayer, the whole, that was a little bit of a red flag too, because what? that it felt cult-like. I did have a moment where like, that feels really weird. That feels weird. <laughs> so, so Yeah. Those those two things were were strange, and I do remember my first experience being like, I'm not sure how I feel about that. But you, it sounds like you were kind of already assuming that the the church is true, obviously. Mm -hmm. So there's something wrong, and something that you're going to have to learn. You're just going to have to keep going over yeah. and over again you, until you. It had to be me. Mm -hmm. Until that's you called understand blame it. reversal. When whenever there's a problem. It's you that's the problem. And I was used to that. Like yeah. just my nature and my upbringing, I was used to that. That that was a very easy narrative in my brain to follow. It was just that it had to be me. So I embraced that. I was like, okay, I guess I just need to go more. I already felt I, I was less than. I had things to learn. So. Makes you more committed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it was, that was my temple experience. And my husband, he didn't, we didn't ever talk a lot about it. He didn't like going. He definitely didn't like going. There were a few times that I went by myself, but even still, I probably have been to the temple maybe 10, 20 times in my whole life. I haven't been a lot, um, but more than he has. He didn't really like, he didn't like being there. And he, the first time he saw the temple close, he saw somebody walking by in the temple close before we'd ever had gone through the endowment. And he thought, you know, it looked like a chef's hat. He's like, I wonder if they have a kitchen somewhere. That was his, <laughs> he was like, mm, anyway. That was his impression of the clothing at first. Like, hmm, there's a chef that's walking around here. Oh, wait, I'm going to be wearing that in about 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, they definitely do not prep you for that. Oh, wait, these are the clothes I'm going to be wearing too. Anyway. Did he get endowed the same day as you? Yes. You went through together? Yes. Okay. That's a kind of rare. Most couples never yeah. get that chance. Yeah, we experienced that together. So Because oh. normally the boy goes through. If he's been on an LDS mission, he would have gone through before me. But it was new for both of us. So. So yeah, we did it all together. So that was cool. Hope you had an interesting car ride home, chitty chatting, <laughs> right? Or just, not, or you just don't talk about it. We didn't it, right? talk about it. That's what I was wondering. Because you're talk about the temple, right? We so. didn't talk about it. We went back, we did go back in St. George, I think one time. Um, and the one we were asked to be the witness couple, which is um, for those, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. We just looked like we needed to be the witness couple to whoever was asking that day. Um, but that, is, for those who don't know, for those who aren't Mormon, there is an altar at the at the front of the room of the endowment room. And a couple is asked to kind of uh, show everybody um, what's supposed to be done. So and play the role of Adam Play the role of Adam and Eve. Right. And at be the altar in at the altar. Yeah. And we've been asked more than once. There was another time we were asked to do it. I think it was my cousin's wedding in Manti. So yeah, we've done it more than once. And so did and you like it? Did you have a panic attack? <laughs> no, I was good. I felt like I was arriving. Yeah, <laughs> the scarlet letter was fading. I was becoming more <laughs> right? more righteous. I yeah. don't know. So yeah, I it was it was a good feeling. It was validating for me. I was like, they're feeling my spirituality now. It's been there all along. I'm finally being recognized. Now so you're, your countenance glows yeah, when was, you get to arriving. come to the front to be the, yeah. the couple at the altar. Yeah. So I think no, that I was, mean, they, you, you were taught that you were, sh you know, you were shamed into feeling unworthy mm -hmm. for a couple decades. Yeah. And then if you get it, if you start obeying and following, wow, magically you start feeling worthy and you start feeling better. Right. Once you start obeying what they want right. you to do. Right, which which I definitely say I would ex I experienced. Yeah. I definitely it started. It feels good. It did feel it felt much better. <laughs> it's way better not to be shunned in your society and your culture. <laughs> yeah, it felt a lot better. So so yeah, that was good. Yeah. It was good. So at my temple experience, I, I can't ever say that it was horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, it, some of it was validating. You know, being the witness couple. Um, but my husband really never liked to go. And for me, I always, he did express that a little bit, you know, when I'd be like, you know, you want to go with me trying to drive that religion bus? And he's like, eh, eh, you know, I don't really want to go. And so I always tried to be respectful of that. But then again, I would, you know, I start putting the pressure on him 
you know, to perform A, B, C, and D. You got to start doing these things, dude, because it's your job now, you know, so I'm doing what I've been taught to do and trying to pressure my husband to start, you know, being what he's supposed to be so we can fit into the culture. We can fit into the society. We can, everybody can be proud of us. You know, I wanted that. I wanted everybody to be proud of us. So I was the driving force and I, I did, I did start putting pressure on him. Why are you getting, why are you feeling emotions? Um, just cause I wish I wouldn't have, you know, I think it's a respect thing. You know, he was feeling those things. He wasn't comfortable there. He wasn't comfortable at the temple and he, he wasn't necessarily super great at voicing that, you know, but I had, I had this, you know, my agenda was now the same agenda as the church. The fact that I adopted that and I kind of pushed that and maybe potentially made him feel bad. Makes me feel bad now, you know, in hindsight. Um, yeah, just not be not, not as respectful as I should have been to his feelings. And it starts to repeat the role yes. of, of your parents' oh. marriage, right? It, yeah. it used to, I don't want to fill that in. I don't want to project that. Yeah. Yeah. In a way. Um, but then my husband was like never antagonistic. He didn't, he wasn't, he's not super interested in, in, in the reading and the intellectual side of things like my dad is. So my dad was pushy. Like when he was going to say something, he was going to say something and it was going to be in your face. So my husband was not like that. So I always felt peaceful being married to my husband. I never felt like he was pushing anything on me. If anything, it was the reverse because I became my dad in our relationship. That, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. That I would, I kind of uh, just in my demeanor, in my nature that I was, I became pushy with my husband. Not, not overly so and not as much as many of the stories that I've heard but enough that I, I do feel a little bit bad about it now. So. So how did yeah. that change your family? Um, Going through the temple. How did it change and our your church family? experience? Like take us forward, I guess. Okay. So oh, the wedding, is there anything you want to say about the actual wedding? No, Okay. not really. Not both I, parents were there. Yep. My mom and dad were there. His parents were there. Um, both my husband's religious grandma and my religious grandma were there. <laughs> Uh, a couple aunts and uncles. It was pretty small, actually. On religious grandpas? Uh, one, I think, let's see. My, who was excluded? Who was excluded? Um, it was very quiet. If anybody would have been excluded, it would probably, you know, would have been my dad. Um, okay. But we kept the invitation list pretty small just okay. because it was it was two years after we had been married. So everybody that we really cared about had seen us married. Okay. So we just invited those we felt like it would really matter to, you know, and the people that really mattered to us a lot, you know, just having my, both my parents there mattered to me. So, so I asked them, but yeah, I don't feel like anybody, I hope that I'm not missing anybody. <laughs> I hope nobody felt ex excluded on that day. So thankfully we didn't have a whole lot of that, but I don't know. I do have guilt looking back and pushing, putting the pressure on my dad to be there. So, so yeah, but moving on, um, yeah, we, like I said, we're married for four years before we had kids and we were in and out of being active throughout, throughout that time. And we lived in multiple different places in Utah County and down in St. George just for the nine months. But, um, four years in, we had Savannah. That's where I come in. <laughs> Yay. Welcome Savannah. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so she was born in the covenant, which, you Means know, what? which means when you've been married in the temple, um, that your children are born in, in the covenant, they're automatically, they're automatically sealed, to sealed to you. Which means what? <laughs> we, to you. we get to be, we would get to be a family forever. If, if we keep the covenants that we made in the temple. So I was good up until I was eight, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, how did your family change like our, like my husband and I and our children or like everything, yeah. just everything. Did, did going to the temple change your family? Um, well, I know that on his side of the family that they were very, they were. And I mean, your relationship in, with your kids, and, you know, your trajectory. Um, yeah, yeah, it did. We, we were just on the path to Mormondom. I mean, we were, we were on the right path, the right path, you know, after going through the temple, you know. Which means you started doing what behaviors? Uh, we, 
we got better at going to church because, like I said, we had a hard time integrating. But once Savannah was born, we were all in. Yeah, I don't remember like a time in my childhood um, up until my late teens that we weren't going to church. We went like even every move that we had, we started in new wards. I remember different primaries. Like I, I have like really, really early memories in a church building. So, yeah. so she actually got a more Mormon um, upbringing, upbringing yeah. than I did. I am ensured that she. What does all in mean? We went to church every Sunday. We went to youth activities. We went to activity days when we were young. Um, what about family prayer, scripture study? We didn't do meeting? so much scripture study. We did a lot of family prayer, and we would like pray over my husband's meals. Family. And so, yeah, at the end of the night, before we all went to our own rooms to go to bed, we would say prayers. Um, we would try to do family home evening. It was never a super consistent thing. It was usually when, like— We'd have a lesson in church that was just like, oh, you guys should be doing family home evening. We'd do it for two weeks and then we kind of faltered off. So that was never really consistent part, especially because we all had pretty busy schedules. But but definitely weekly church attendance. Yes. Definitely. Coffee? Oh, Absolutely no. not. Tea? No. Well, no. okay, tea. Yes. Kind I did of. do some tea just because I had only herbal though. Yeah, I had herbal some tea. I yeah, had some stomach tea. issues and peppermint tea seemed okay. seemed to help. That and so I but I remember I asked right? my bishop about it to make sure that it was okay. And he's like, this was when we lived in Colorado. He's like, honestly, he's like, I really don't know that much about tea. Um, he's like, do you feel good about it? And I was like, yes, I feel fine about it. It's helping my stomach. <laughs> and so he's like, it's fine. Then do you feel worthy to go to the temple? I said, yes. So that was, yes. Yeah. So occasionally a little bit of tea. No alcohol. No. Tobacco. No. Drugs. No. Okay. Is this None. a bishop's interview? <laughs> yeah. I just want you know, to know what, what, oh, yeah, I know what the way is. You know what yeah. I mean? That what, is the way. Yep, that yeah. is the way. Yes. That is the way. Yeah. So like Mandalorian. <laughs> <laughs> that is, this is the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we, raising the kids in the church, they were all, Chris blessed all of them. He baptized all of them. And I was, you know, making sure that we were, we were in. That Tithing? We, Yes. Oh, well, okay. okay. So early on when they were really little, not so much. So there was a, um, up until the point when we moved to Colorado, which is kind of a transition point in our marriage and in our family. Um, we, we weren't great at paying tithing before that, but after we moved, so let me back up just a teeny bit. My husband worked with my dad in construction and with my older sister in construction, who also graduated from BYU in construction management, my sister and my dad, and then my husband were all, they were all partners in my dad's company that he'd run for a really long time. So we were, we were very enmeshed as a family and I was not super comfortable with that. Like I had a really hard time with that. Um, just cause I have a lot of daddy issues and, and with this particular older sister too, I just had a lot of issues. And so I needed a break. I needed to break from that. And so I was pushing for him, my husband to stop working with my dad and my sister and we needed to make a break and go, go somewhere else. And so secretly we were kind of talking about it. Um, I also kind of got, had gotten to the point where I wanted to go to college. So I applied at CSU in Colorado, Colorado state university. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I got accepted. So that was one of the reasons it's like, okay, let's go. You know, there's a reason there's the reason we needed to let's go. There's also like but I had three little kids. I don't know what I was thinking to, I mean, people do it all the time, but anyway, I was so, a Mormon mommy wanting to get educated. Um, it was, it that's was, off, a, that's off script. That's off plan. Yeah. I mean, once you've had the kids, right? Yeah, it was, um, <laughs> okay. I, I dove into the narrative, the Mormon mommy narrative. I had my three little kids. By the time we were going to move to Colorado, I had three little kids. I had, how old were you when we moved to Colorado? I was eight. I'd just been baptized. She'd just been baptized. Um, and by this time, um, the kids were starting to get a little bit older, where it's like, I was realizing, I don't know who the heck I am. I have no identity. You know, I had never, like, getting married at 18, I had no idea who I was. And... Um, I kind of started to dream a little bit. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I'm not as dumb as I thought I was. Maybe I could do more than being a hairstylist. No, no, not just thing on hairstylists. It's a, it's a great occupation and it's, it served me well, but I wanted more. I wanted, I wanted a little bit more. And so I think just getting accepted to college was actually a huge step for me, a huge step with my self-esteem. Um, it's a little bit off script though. I'm not, I mean, I don't want to yeah. misjudge Mormon. 
Yeah. The, the Mormon way, but yeah. So for me, did you know with that at the time that that kind of wasn't what was always done? Um, the going to the going to college was, uh, with with three little kids. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I knew that that was that was probably a little too ambitious, but I but there was a part of me that really wanted it. So I think just even applying and doing. Um, uh, just filling all the, out all the paperwork and writing an essay and all of those kinds of things that you have to do to get in college was like really cool for me. And it was validating for me to get accepted into college. And that's not a big deal for a lot of people, but for me, that was a big deal. Um, so we're like, okay, let's go. Let's, let's up and move. My dad was really upset with that decision. Um, but it was healthy. It was really healthy for us to break away from my family and from Utah County and move in outside the bubble. It was really great. Um, our family, like our our church family in Colorado became our family while we were there. Those were our closest friends. It's almost like no matter where you move with the LDS church, you have kind of a built-in family system. If you're going to be active, if you're going to stay on the path, you have a built-in family. So immediately, that was one of the first things we did when we moved to Colorado was we, we sought out the closest ward, the bishop, and and got ourselves integrated there and made some really wonderful friends um, while we were there. I did not end up attending college because I realized that that was a little too ambitious. And we were really poor. This was when... <laughs> 2008 economy This crash. was when the economy tanked. And it was a good time to break away from my dad's company and do something different. We sold off everything we had, our house, our van. We had one vehicle and we took the kids and we moved to Colorado. <laughs> my dad yep. thought we were nuts. He's like, what are you doing? You know, and... My husband went and worked at Home Depot for a little while, and which was a huge step down. He'd been building parade homes with my dad here. Um, it was it, so financially, whew, it was it was really tough. That was a really tough time. Um, I ended up going to uh, to I did go to work while we were there as a beautician because I could make good money in Colorado as a beautician. So, had as soon as all the kids were in school, I. I went to work at a high-end salon there, and um, that was that was great. That was a good experience. So, and I it increased my self-esteem, my self-worth as a woman to be providing in a way, you know, to be able to make make the good money. There were days that you know I was doing making three or four hundred dollars a day just doing hair. So it was good. It was good. So I mean, I, I just want to just note some of these subtleties along the way. Mm -hmm that it, the Mormon church has taught forever that a woman's place is in the home, that women don't need an education beyond, you know, yeah. uh, whatever they get before they get married, but that their primary role is to be a mommy and a yeah. housewife. Um, that the woman shouldn't work outside the home, which you were kind of technically sinning, but, but also <laughs> just trying to survive. Yeah. Right. Yes. But then also in Mormonism, there's this general, you know, there's a love-hate relationship with education because if you're going to become an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer mm -hmm. and you're a man, then yes, get educated because then you'll become a, a, a successful, wealthy sort of provider to your family and the church. Right. But then any kind of liberal arts education or any education for women is at best unnecessary, Yeah. but at worst dangerous because uh, yep. because faith is what matters, right? You know, the learned become prideful. Yeah, the learned find out, start asking questions. Yes, and and um, and so there's this love hate relationship with education in the church, but especially with with women, because yeah. it can lead to a it can lead to faithlessness. It could lead to what the church would call pride, right? And apostasy. Yeah. What maybe the rest of the world would call enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But you were empowering yourself. Yes. Which is dangerous to faith. Yeah. I don't know if you felt that at the time. Um, to me, it just felt good. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, I did. Okay. I had moments. Okay. So when my youngest was finally old enough to go to preschool in kindergarten, I was like, oh, you're going. You know, you're going because mama needs this kind of a thing. I was having, I was having a hard time. I, I don't know that really looking back on it now that I was as wired for Mormon mommyhood as I thought that I was. Um, just because there was this part of me that was always trying to speak up. Like I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn. I wanted to, 
I wanted to experience more than just being a stay at home mom. And I don't, I don't disparage that. I think it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. Some people are better at it than others. I was okay. <laughs> I was okay. Um, my mom was incredible, was an incredible stay at home mom still is like us kids. We are her everything. And she's awesome. And I, I remember feeling guilt anytime I had a thought that that might not be enough for me, you know, but I, but those things were absolutely creeping up. Once I got out of the stage with my kids, when they were all consuming, you know, when they could all go to school, <laughs> I, remember I was like, Oh, I, breathing a sigh of relief and being like, okay, I can learn something. I can figure out who the heck I am. I can, I can breathe. You know, it was, it was really tough. So baby steps toward that for sure. Um, that just felt amazing. It was empowering for me to earn some money to contribute. Contributing was huge for me. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Still love it. Still, you know, just to be able to contribute is huge to our, our home in that way financially is, is an awesome thing. I encourage any woman out there to do it, <laughs> figure out ways to do it because it's so healthy. I became a healthier individual once I was working and healthier for my family too. And even though it was just, it was just going, you know, to work in a salon, my youngest, I'm like, okay, yeah, you're doing all day kindergarten. Cause they, they offered that in Colorado. As soon as she was doing that, I was working, um, quite a bit, um, in the salon and it was, it was good. Not, not my, not my perfect environment, but, um, but to earn that money was great. It was Did great. Did you feel any guilt for not yes. following the church's path? What, why? What, what would have made you feel guilt? Um, just that narrative that my place was in the home, you know, and that I might be, um, again, no success can compensate for failure in the home. That was ingrained. I did have that. I did worry about that. I did worry about, you know, failing my kids in some way, not being what they needed me to be. Um, I had never heard a narrative that um, just being an, an example of a working mom for your children would be a good thing. You know, I'd never heard of that before. And the first time I, I, I saw examples of that, it was very emotional for me because um, to see that your kids can watch you, um, just that it's your example, you know, that teaches them, yes, you can also be there for your kids and be a working parent. You can provide the things that they need and still have a good loving relationship with your kids and, and, and not be the reason that, you know, that they're going to fail, <laughs> you know? So super, super awesome time for me in Colorado. A lot of growth for me and for my husband there. He, he got his contractor's license there, started his own company while we lived there. So he, he grew wings as well in a way there. So um, we gained some independence. We grew super tight in it as our own little family unit. Um, it was a beautiful three years, very healthy in many ways for us. Though we were like so in the church, which is the odd while part, we were yeah. there. <laughs> so what's this like for you in Colorado, Savannah? I loved Colorado. In a lot of ways, I still really consider it a home away from home because I didn't, I didn't feel that conformity that I was expected to feel. Um, so when I was there, I went, I was the third grade through fifth grade there. And Do you I want to talk about what it was like before Colorado for you. Yeah, that'd probably be good. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So no, let's back up good. and just talk back about up. you. Um, so yeah, I was born in Provo. I was, you know, came out of her. <laughs> um, yeah, we were very consistent in the church. I, um, I was a very big personality. I talked very early. I was reading books very early. Um, I drove her nuts <laughs> just because I was a sponge. I wanted all this information. Um, no, I kind of loved it. I kind of loved it. I loved reading. I mean, you to read her to me a lot. Her. Like she read to me so much when I was younger. Um, but I, I didn't really love church. I maybe was four and I was in the kitchen telling my mom, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to put on a dress. I don't want to wear tights. Like I want to just stay in my sh shorts and play and do what I want on Sunday. Um, but we you know, some we went, we, we definitely had some battles. Um, but we went and I, I guess I was kind of indifferent. I mean, I was like, I was baptized at eight and then we moved to Colorado. So like, I mean, early on, it was just a part of life. I didn't really give it a ton of thought. I mean, there were some things like I did grow up hearing the conversations with my mom and my grandpa. And so there were, there were little things, the types of like stuff about Joseph Smith, some things that were questionable. Um, I think I like just 
absorbed some of that and was kind of put it on my shelf, you know, as you do. But um, I do remember when we lived in Utah before I moved to Colorado, um, asking a primary teacher, I was really young, like asking a primary teacher, didn't Joseph Smith have another wife? Like when they were talking, teaching us about Emma and Joseph Smith and the teacher like got super uncomfortable. And I was like, okay. And she's, and she tells me, she's like, yeah, he took on one other wife toward the end of his life, <laughs> which is very much not true. But, um, I was like, okay, that's weird. But um, the fact that I was asking those questions super young, I was probably just absorbing a lot of the conversations my mom was having with my grandparents. And so yeah. I was just trying to connect those dots. And so, so a lot of that stuff was uh, kind of implanted, and I, but it was just kind of there. Um, so yeah, then we moved to Colorado. We had a lot of Mormon friends, but in addition to that, I was one of three Mormons in my elementary school. So like- um, <laughs> That's a lot in Colorado. Yeah, yeah, so many. In <laughs> what yeah. city were you guys in? We were in Fort, Fort Collins. Collins. Yeah, so yeah. it's like a little bit north of Denver. We lived there when that temple got announced. Yeah, so. so um, but I also had friends who were Catholic. I had friends who, and most of my friends didn't go to church at all. It wasn't really a mm -hmm. big thing for them. And I remember being in our art class, and we all talked about what we did on Sundays. And I remember my Catholic friend teaching me about communion. And I was like, oh, it's kind of like our sacrament thing. You know, it's different, but um, it's kind of similar. So I was exposed to that variety of religious views pretty early on. And um, so that was great. I didn't feel pressures of the community as much. I felt more free to be myself. Um, and then it was the biggest culture shock moving from Colorado to Utah, like the heart of Utah County, Springville. And um, going into sixth grade, it was weird because all of a sudden everyone was Mormon. And all of the standards that I kept as a Mormon in Colorado seemed to be applied to everyone regardless of if you were a Mormon or not. They were just universal community standards rather than they were just for us. What town again? Uh, Springville. Springville. So that's also still Utah County. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's for those just who don't know, it's kind of south of 15 minutes south of Provo. Yeah. yeah which it's is where yeah. BYU really is. close. So it was just all of a sudden that was universal. There were churches on every corner. My elementary school was right next to a stake center. And like even still, like they're all over the place. And so that was a huge culture shock. And um I was, I remember writing in like my sixth grade journal, I'm like everybody looks at me weird. Like, um, cause I was, I was still a big personality and a lot of people were super quiet and super clicky. So it was just very hard to integrate into those groups cause your church friends were your school friends. And if you weren't part of that already, that you didn't grow up there with them, it was a lot harder to integrate than when I moved from Utah to Colorado and everybody was a lot more unified in Colorado just because we were kids rather than religion wasn't a huge difference. It wasn't a huge factor. So that was a huge difference. So you were, it, there were, it was clicky and did you struggle to find a group? Or? Yeah, it was very difficult because I mean, until I started like, so the standards I said are a lot higher, you know, and um, Mormon standards and the way of like the lifestyle is pretty much universal. And then if you're not Mormon, you're very ostracized. You're not included um, unless they're trying to fellowship you. Often they don't know how. Yeah, they just don't know how because it's really like you're not the same when everybody's very, um, very similar in belief. Um, so, yeah, it was it was really difficult to, um, you know, get myself into friend groups until I started acting super Mormon until I embodied that. Cause like, I mean, I was a very like over, very much an overachiever. So as soon as I realized I'm like, okay, I have to be the best Mormon I can in order to make friends in order to adapt. And so I went all in like she really, she, she did well. We were pleased. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, um, we moved back to Utah when I like right after Colorado, when I was maybe 11 or 12, I was just going into sixth grade and, um, yeah, I did. I, I like started doing everything, you know, we, and there were a lot more activities, um, during the weekdays than there were in Colorado. And I was in young women's now. So it's like, we had church, we had like young women's like activities once a week. And, um, yeah. And so I just, I was praying, I was reading my scriptures. I was like going to, um, activities. I was planning activities. I got my patriarchal blessing when I was 12 years old. What does that mean? So, What's a patriarchal blessing and when is it normally given? So a patriarchal blessing is like, I mean, it, it's kind of a fortune telling, but like it's a very um, personal, unique blessing given to you by a ward patriarch. Super old, usually a super old super man. Super old guy. Super old guy, yeah. That has been given the keys to 
to give yeah, to a revelation. Blessing. So it's like a basically a blessing given to you from God that is written down and you get to keep and is kind of a guidance a throughout reference. your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm living all these standards. I'm doing really good Mormon stuff. You know, I'm gonna. I think I can do it. I think I'm old enough. I'm ready to get my blessing. So just the baseline. I was a super devout Orthodox Mormon. I think I got mine at 16. Yeah. And I think that's kind of more normal. To yeah, get 14 to 16. I feel like it's 16. pretty normal. But I and was. You wanted to be uber Mormon. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I was going, 12. I was 12. Yeah, I was the youngest the patriarch had ever given a blessing to. We encouraged her to wait. We wanted her to wait, but she was pretty insistent. No, mom, I feel like I feel yeah, like I, I felt, need to I do felt this. Ready. So I'm, I'm just like, like okay, I think we'll I, pursue yeah, it. I'm ready. So, and then, I mean, they asked me to fast, and so I fasted. And then um, a couple Sundays later, we went um, after church to the patriarch's house and um, gave me like put his hands on my head, you know, and gave me this like really big like talk before and after, and then gave me my blessing, and it was pretty long. It tells you um, what tribe you are from the twelve tribes of Israel, and um, I, I remember think your tribe. I was an Ephraim, so which is the big like missionary um, one. So that's it's like your, your job. That's the job. Is a, if you're in the tribe of, in the Ephraim, tribe of Ephraim, is the missionary work. <laughs> I, I swear, half my blessing was about going on a mission. Yeah. And um, it told me I was going to have a lot of kids, like, yeah. <laughs> which was uh, not in the cards for me. I was, I mean, when I was little, I was telling, I was asking her to like, hey, mom, will you watch my kids while I go to work? I was, was like it, really yeah. young. Like and not even like, kidding. Yeah, I don't even I remember know if I those want conversations. kids, you know, and I was, I was, I was so little. I was it's like too young to it, be thinking about that, but so she you're gonna, was going to go on a mission be a missionary. Yeah, be a have mission. Lo- have married, lots of have kids. Lots of kids. Uh, yeah, and it's like basically. But she was t- already trying yeah. to pawn her kids off on me. Exactly. I'm just like, yeah, my hypothetical kids. That I'm thinking about as like a four year old, you know, like because that's something that's so expected of you, and like they indoctrinate that into you very young that you uh, you should be a mom and have kids as your number one priority. They should be your biggest goals. So I mean, I felt like that was a pretty spiritual experience getting my patriarchal blessing, but also I now I look back on that and I think it's. I, it was so special to me because it was somebody saying, confirming, oh, you are going to be great. You are going to do something important. And it's like that was very validating for me because that's always feelings I'd had in myself. And that was like I'm reading like so, tons of books and her like encouraging like me. And it was all like something that was confirming for me. That was like I'm going to be something great. Um, I just have to say there are a couple more techniques that are, I identify there. Mm-hmm. One is kind of this idea of mystical power. So you, you talk about it being fortune telling. Mm-hmm. Uh, a patriarchal blessing, just like kind of priesthood blessings for healing. Yeah. It's one of these moments where the church is telling you, you're about to engage in the supernatural. This this yes. guy who's yeah. super righteous and faithful, this older man, now gets to talk to God and see the future for you for you, and tell you what your future is going to be. That's, you know, if, if I could tell you your future that would get, make me a very powerful, special person. And that's what every Mormon teen is is experiencing is the impression yeah. that this man is now going to predict the future on your behalf. So that's one thing. It's imbuing in you the sense that the church men with the priesthood have special powers like Superman. Like Yeah, definitely. But then but then secondly, it's just something you notice about these patriarchal blessings. They never say You'll be single. You'll be a great working mom. You will, you know, you will yeah, go on and general. be a CEO of a major Fortune 500 <laughs> corporation. Yeah, no. yeah. You will have no kids, but you will go to Africa and serve, <laughs> you know, help bring water to, yeah. pop, you know, starving yeah. populations. Everything is always what the church wants you to yeah, yeah. do. So it's Very a form so. of yeah. telling you your future. It's, it's, um, it's pretty easy it's, to tell the future when everybody's future is te- like supposed to be the same. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. a form of control because oh, it's 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 posed as predict or foretelling the future. But what it's really doing is it's a self fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. It's telling you be a mom, have mm-hmm. lots of kids, be a missionary for the church. It's yeah. all. I, I, I'm not saying it's intentionally this way because I think the patriarchs believe oh, that they're channeling the yeah. future. And of course, it's all based on your worthiness. So if none of this comes to pass, there's the blame reversal where it's going to all be put back on you as well. You didn't live up to your righteousness. Right. But it, but it is, yeah. unfortunately, it's a very controlling technique that basically tells you, here's your place, here's your role. You're going to be a mommy with lots of kids, which yep. incidentally is what your mom 
was before you and yep. her mom was before her. And it's exactly the role the church wants you to fill. Yeah. And it's like, I remember being like, kinda, is that fair? I don't yeah, mean I think, to I think, that. no, I totally yeah. think that's fair. Um, yeah. I just remember being kind of disappointed. I'm just like, is there anything kind of cooler? <laughs> I didn't want to like diss on the role of like motherhood because I had always been taught that was the most important thing like that you could do as a woman. And I was like, okay, that's cool. But I want to do other things too. And so for a, quite a while during that super Mormon period of my life, I was like, okay, so I guess I'll have that later. And that'll be something I'm kind of feeling feeling like I have to do, I guess I'm just going to dive in to try and be like the best future missionary that I could be. But I think the reason I played into that is because I really wanted to escape. I really wanted to travel. I had all these dreams and I'm like, okay, that's the closest thing within Mormonism that fits cl close enough, you know, that could get me out and having life experiences and being kind of who I want to be, you know, it's close. I'm going to get. So I dove into doctrine. I started, I read a ton. Um, and I actually got my young women, uh, young women recognition medallion, which is kind of like, um, kind of like an Eagle Scout, but for young women, it's a lot less work. <laughs> um, but yeah, you go through. It's not fun. It's it's not, it's not fun. fun to get it. <laughs> um, but you do a bunch of like uh, service things and read a bunch of scriptures and basically check off all these requirements. And um, it's like a female Eagle Scout. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Equivalent. And so once yeah. you do all that, you get your young womanhood medallion and certificate, um, and it's like the highest award you can get as a young woman. And I did that like days before I finished it days before I turned 13 as I wanted to make sure that like I could do it a before I was third like, before I turned 14 and B so I could be recognized like on the stand in um, church on Sunday as like one of the youngest people in the ward who had done that. Um, and why were you wanting to hyper achieve even in a Mormon context? I mean, I was always an overachiever. I really wanted to um, I was very all in Um and especially like trying to f like fit in. I just wanted to show everybody that I could be this perfect Mormon, you know? Um, and I was very ambitious. So like that mm -hmm. seemed like the easiest way to do so is to just achieve as much as I could, you know, but it actually burnt me out faster. <laughs> well, we'll get there. Yeah, for sure. Did you feel like the, I'm watching you. Sm were you going to say something? I was there? just going to ask. It sounds like you had a lot of this performative nature then. So did oh, your definitely. peers and did the people at school and church, did you feel like they looked up to you and you had to like, continue along yeah. this line. Um, I think I was also overcompensating, overcompensating for the fact that I was, I personality wise did not fit the mold mm -hmm. of what Mormon like girls were supposed to no, be. I was very loud. I was argumentative. I had no problem telling people when they were wrong, <laughs> um, which kind of sucks because like um, I look back and I was, a lot of the things I did were um, very judgmental. Like I was, I was that Mormon girl who's going to judge you if you weren't doing everything perfectly because I want to, I was making sure I was doing everything perfectly. So, um, yeah, it was very performative in nature and it was definitely overcompensating for a bunch of other things. The deficits I had, cause I wasn't the perfect Mormon girl, um, just by nature. I didn't, I did not fit into that, um, Mormon female role easily at all. Um, so that was the closest thing I could get, but I did get super frustrated when um, all the young men got to do way cooler things. Like and what? They got to go and like do all these like uh, high adventure things. They got to do scouting. She watched her dad taking them doing and all of so these things. I was so mad. Floating, hiking. And I was so mad. Yeah, which we did as a family. We like sat in the church and made bookmarks, like as the did. young women. Yes. Yeah, and While it the boys sucked. were out doing high adventure. Yeah, and they always want to do like just domestic homemaking things, and I got really frustrated because my my dad is the type of person that's like, let's go do stuff, and he would always take us canyoneering and hiking, and I went hunting with him as like a kid. And so it's just like to, the fact that he was taking me to do these things, but I had to do it separately as our family rather than as part of my role in the church. I, I was so, I was like so jealous that he got to take the young men to hike King's Peak and do these overnight camping trips. And so you get pretty bent out of shape. Yeah, I was so mad. And then, I mean, at 11, I was like, hey, dad, can I do an Eagle Scout thing? Because I'd finished my young women recognition. I'm like, what's next for me? But, um... Yeah, it's just kind of shot down just because it was like only boys can do the Eagle Scout stuff, you know? Well, I mean, he was, he was willing to walk through and do those but things with you. But I couldn't get you, any of the official You couldn't get the awards. You so couldn't get there, the same. I didn't end up doing it, but that was something I would have done had it been like for me. Yeah, your tone chip. Uh, I did get my tone chip because <laughs> I wanted a Each pocket of the knife. Did that. What is that? 
my it's a, it's a boy scout thing to, to that, use a, um, a pocket knife safely and whatnot my husband made each of them do the the scouting requirements before they could have a pocket knife. yeah it's called what the to, tote and chip is totem chip yeah okay so it's like <laughs> yeah basically a safety thing you do before you can get a knife when, when you're a boy scout and so once he made all of us girls do it you didn't um, you wanted to i wanted to but like before because we wanted a pocket knife because that was cool and um, mm-hmm. so he made us do that Boy Scout thing beforehand, which yeah. was cool. So where I mean, he had no sons, he was very much, he did all the, the things you might do with sons with our girls. Yeah. So he so, was very good that way. Yep. Okay. I have two super quick questions okay. for you, Linda, yeah. as you reflect on Savannah. So there's two themes I want you to address. One is I'm already seeing her as a 12 and 13 year old girl. Mm-hmm hyper achieve in ways that you didn't yes and i'm wondering as a parent as, as you had all this shame and inadequacy mm-hmm. what it's like to see your oldest daughter yeah b- maybe i don't want to project mm-hmm. but like living out the dream that you didn't live out and yeah. her becoming what you didn't become as a girl that's right. the first thing okay and then the second one is were you and 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 Treat each one separately, if you don't mind. Okay. The second one is, what was it like? Did you notice that her personality maybe wasn't a perfect fit with the mold? Mm-hmm. And and were you sensing any of that discrepancy? And how were you processing that? But let's start with, how did it feel as a mom to see your daughter living the the going down the path that you didn't quite follow? Yeah. Did you feel great? You know, I... I tried to teach her from the time she was young. I was very encouraging um, just because I feel like my, my natural gifts as a kid were not like, they weren't spotted. They weren't really noticed by my parents. And so that was, that was a hard thing for me. So I was like super alert to what my kids natural gifts were. So I was always super encouraging. Okay. You're curious about Egypt. Let's go to the library and get books about Egypt. Let's like go. <laughs> I mean, at a really young age, she was just fascinated with cultures and she didn't really necessarily want to read all the fiction stuff. We did read fiction together, but she was like, I want to learn about people. I want to learn about cultures. I want to learn. About, and so I like yeah. fed her everything I could find on I those kinds like of things. I was like asking the librarian for books on ancient We Egypt. visited <laughs> libraries. We like, I, knowledge and education was always really, really important. I was a big reader as a kid. Thank heaven. I was a big reader. That was my saving grace. So that was the one one thing I really made sure to instill in the kids. And um, Savannah ate it up, gobbled it up from the time she could communicate with me. I mean, from six months, she was pointing, you know, asking me what everything was called. She was, and she could speak really early. So I loved it. I loved seeing her um, want to learn. And I really encouraged that. I, I knew how valuable that would be for her. And the fact that she loved it, I just really encouraged it. Thrilled. I was thrilled with that, that she was wanting to learn and was so ambitious with learning. So yeah, I tried very hard to encourage her. I would say that yeah. I, I was we encouraging. Read a ton. Like, that was yeah, we read a lot together. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I wasn't real good at playing with my kids. I, I'm, I just wasn't wired that way. And I felt, I did feel guilty for that sometimes. I wasn't a good mom that way, but the way that I could be a good mom was to read with my kids, to provide, you know, opportunities like that to learn. So I was, I would loved it. I loved it that she was very ambitious and that she, that what she was. the righteousness part? You know, I was, I, I liked seeing that. At the state that at the stage that we were in, I was like, great, you know, she's on the path. She's doing the things she's supposed to do. I was proud of her when she wanted to get her blessing that early. And I was willing to help her, um, encourage her to, if she wanted to do it, we did it. You know, I ended up getting a huge fight with my dad over that patriarchal blessing. Yeah, we're getting to that. <laughs> when she but got that. That so. was a, yeah, that was, um, the, probably we, the first. We missed that. What happened? Um, so. Um, so when they, when you get your patriarchal blessing, they have tape recorders and they record it and they transcribe that and write it down for you in an official like document. Um, and you get that later. We didn't talk to my dad about it when she got her patriarchal no. blessing. He didn't why, go? Your dad no. didn't go? Why, well, her dad did but, yeah. go, so but my dad my grandma. did not. Um, so her dad. And, uh, so when... And we kept it from him. We didn't want him. Yeah, to know. we didn't really tell him, but he also knew the patriarch because of like building stuff, right? Through they, the airport, actually. Through the airport. Okay, so yeah, my grandpa knew the patriarch that I'd gotten my blessing from, but we didn't really uh, talk to him about it. We kept it under wraps because at this point, um, my grandparents, my mom's parents, were very were ex Mormons. We don't talk about that. We don't spend a lot of time with them. Um, they because, were ex-Mormons. Yes, my were, parents, yes. yes. Yeah. So when so. she was baptized at eight, my parents had just had their names removed from the records of the Whoa. church. Yeah. Both. What year was that? 
It would have been, what year were you baptized? Oh, what year? 2010? Was, so 11 10, years 11, ago. Yeah, 2010, 2011. 2010. Um, okay, so your parents, so, okay, so maybe we I'm, need to back I'm up thinking a of my bit. timeline, 2010, so Mormon story starts in 2005. So between 2005 and 2010, that's when the Mormon internet starts to really emerge, yeah. blogs, yes. yep. podcasts, Mormon yeah. think. This is pre-CS letter. This is pre-Gospel Topics essays. Mm -hmm. But that that 2005 yeah, so to 2010. He, um, he had a lot of books on his shelf, like uh, uh, No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody. And like that's a book I actually have on my bookshelf now from them, <laughs> which is um, – but yeah, at this point, they were the ex-Mormons. We didn't talk to them. We didn't um, – We still talked did to you know them. At we the did, time but that they had resigned So the my, my mom spilled the beans as we were getting ready to move to Colorado. She – because I was inviting her to the baptism, Savannah's baptism. Yeah. And so I – was on the phone with her and, and she started crying and she said, I just want to let you know, you know, that we've had our names removed. Well, we will come, oh. we will come, you know, but she also said, I want you to know that I chose this, that this wasn't, this wasn't your dad pushing it on me because me immediately, I would have gone straight to that. This is dad's fault. The dad's pressured you to, to not be a member anymore. You know, and I. So by this point, your mom has lost her faith. Yes, yes, and I didn't know that. But that she hadn't. She had not brought talked you along about on it. that journey. No, no, she kept it pretty quiet. You know, and it was something that she and my dad were kind of working out on their own. And I'd been out of the house for a long time by by that point, but I didn't know. You know, I knew that my dad was not happy with it, but he, I knew that he had said to her, "I want to have my name removed," and he totally made that clear to me too. Did he say why? Um, he just didn't want to be associated with the church anymore. It got, he, his feelings got stronger and stronger as the years went on. I think the more you learn that it tends to do that. Yes. Um, but, uh, so he was reading books. Probably. Oh, all kinds of yeah. things. Yeah. Really. I, I think he was pretty educated early on, but it really compounded over the probably years. Grant Palmer's, you know, an insider's view of Mormon origin. All kinds. Yep. He read a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very intellectual guy. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So my mom finally was, was out. And, by and let us know. by around around when we moved to Colorado. Mm -hmm. So when she was baptized, yes, yeah, so that's my and mom. That's unique me. because normally it's the parents and the grandparents that are kind of the enforcers. You know, speaking about milieu mm -hmm. control, mm -hmm. they're the ones that are always pressuring their kids and grandkids to stay faithful. Yeah. So this is where kind of the modern era, let's just say the past 11, yeah. 15, 15, 11 to fifteen years, mm -hmm. things start flipping because it can be the parents and the grandparents that lose their faith first and the, right. and the kids and the grandkids that are staying faithful. Right. And so that's, that's a different experience for you yeah. to have your grandparents apostatize and yeah. re resign from the yes. church. And yes. for you to have your, your faithful mom lose her faith mm -hmm. and, and to tell you she's leaving the church while you're trying to become more faithful. So you and yes. your daughter and your family are becoming more faithful Mm -hmm. While, As while Linda, your parents are, are leaving the church and becoming more angry at the church. What's yes. that like? Uh, boy, the rift grew very between great. me and my parents. I was, there was not, it got to the point where there was not tons of communication. Every communication we had was uh, stressful yeah. um, because that was the elephant in the room. You know, any conversation because we were, we were doing things right. My husband and I and our kids, we were doing things right at that point and and knowing that my mom and dad were completely out, I really did blame my dad. I blamed my dad for my mom's loss of faith. But she and she tried to assure me that it was her, you know, that she'd done some reading. And I was like, no way, because my dad was so I, just a strong personality. My mom's a little more passive. I was like, it's all you, dad. You know, I blamed on him. And, and he um, when my younger sister got married in the temple, my parents did not go through my both my parents were outside by that point because they were no longer members. So, I, I mean, I have two younger sisters. So they missed your sister's wedding. They weddings. missed both of my younger sister's weddings. So I just want to I just want to be clear. These are, in Mormonism, if parents leave the church, they don't get to attend their own children's weddings. Yeah. Just sit with that for a minute. Yeah. Imagine that all these strangers and neighbors get to watch your children get married, your daughter, your son get married, and you're sitting outside the temple and you're missing the whole thing. There's the scarlet letter shame about that. And then there's mm -hmm. just the kind of exclusion yeah. that, that is inhumane. 
oh, and yeah. shameful, I think. Yeah, super painful for my parents. So, yeah, my sister that's just younger than me, when she went through, me and my older sister were there. And I think my, I can't remember, my youngest sister probably wouldn't have been there. I don't remember. But I remember, I do remember walking out of the temple that day and seeing my parents outside the temple. And while we had been inside the temple, Actually, I think maybe all of us were there, all my sisters, because there was a relative that had said to us while we were in the temple, you need to tell your mom that she's done such a great job with you kids, you know, because we were all in there. Yet my parents were sitting outside. So we went out and I, I told my mom that, you know, I said, mom, you know, you need to know that you did a good job. <laughs> you know, how awful <laughs> now, so now that I, now that I think back on it, you know, but the second I spoke to my mother, my dad had my arm in a lock and was dragging me away from her and said, don't you think for a second that she's, that she's not in there, you know, because, because she, uh, what, I can't remember what, what he said to me, but he was protecting my mom, you know, it, because of what she, he knew what she was going through in that moment. And it was such an emotionally intense thing for them to be sitting outside. But I just remember his intensity and pr him protecting my mom when I was speaking to my mom. And I wasn't speaking mean to her or anything. I was just letting her know what, that she'd done a good job and that somebody else was praising how well they'd done, you know, that all their kids were there in the temple. And thinking back on that now, I was like, I, I hated my dad in that moment because he was so intense. And I just remember thinking that his spirit was so, the spirit he brought with him to the temple was so awful. You know, we were just inside having this beautiful, experience and I come out and my dad is angry, you know, so the contradiction, but I, I associated it with evil. I, I didn't associate it with pain, you know, and it's easy for me to do now. My gosh, I can't believe I didn't associate it with pain. I look at it now and hindsight's 2020, you know, but I didn't have compassion for my parents in that moment. I was just angry at my parents and, and hurt that they would have those reactions because we were all doing things right, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and this is just a, I, I, you know, I just have to call these things out because I'm trying to under, I'm trying to understand them better, and I hope this yeah. is helpful to some of our listeners For to sure. start paying attention to this. Number one, Mormons are taught that any negative emotion is bad, so contention's bad, disagreeing is bad, and anger's bad. It's it's all what contention is. What? It's evil. It's evil. It's, it's from the, the devil. devil. Yeah. And so that means that you know your dad is is bad for being angry and sad. So he's being, your parents are being left out of their own daughter's weddings. Mm -hmm. Their other children who are faithful are able to attend, but they're missing their own children's weddings, not because they're bad people, but yeah. because they learned things and just decided this belief system didn't work for them. Right. They're being excluded from their own children's weddings, which of course you're going to be angry. Yeah. And hurt and sad and defensive, and that's yes. healthy. Yes. That's good for you to be angry and sad and disappointed that a church is dividing your family, keeping you out of your own children's weddings. Mm -hmm. But then the church will teach its members that those, see, ex-Mormons, you leave the church and you're angry, you're bitter. Yeah. And so then that becomes this this reinforcing thing to the believer that, yep, see, mom and dad are bitter, mom and dad are angry, yeah. and that's of the devil, and that's contention. And so this is just a very, I don't mean to be pedantic, I don't mean to be ham-fisted, but this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where this supposedly beautiful teaching of eternal families that's supposed to be just so, it's, it's the Mormon church's main <sighs> selling point. It's their premium prize, the eternal family, that yeah. teaching becomes so sinister and pernicious yeah. because what it's really doing is just fracturing oh. and sowing contention in a family and making non-believers out to be horrible, bad people yeah. and sowing contention between father and daughter, between yeah. parents and children. Yeah. Making him evil even to his daughter, uh, you know? that I'm thinking that I'm feeling, you know, evil coming off of him when it's just, it, it was pain. It was just raw pain, you know? So healthy pain. Yeah. Very healthy pain for what he was experiencing. So, and what my mom was experiencing, I can't, I can't imagine. I, I probably will never have to experience that, <laughs> that kind of pain, you know? So I have a lot of compassion now for that, but, but these teachings have 
always caused pain in my family. Always. You know, from from my grandparents to my parents to me, this the, the going to the temple and these teachings have have never brought me joy in my relationships with my family members. It's always brought pain. It's because there's always been somebody that can't conform completely. So, yeah. And the other, what was the other question you wanted me to answer about Savannah jumping back to that? So seeing her being super righteous and then noticing a discrepancy between her personality, strong, assertive, and how, you know, were you seeing how that might, at 12 and 13, did you have any premonition that that might not <laughs> serve her well going down the, the Mormon way, right? For there girls. was a lot of, there was a lot of tone it downs. Yeah. You know? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure I was asking her to tone it down a lot. Um, how was that for you? <laughs> it was hard because I'm just like, I, I didn't feel like I needed to be turned, like turned down. I mean, at this, while I was living the super righteous thing, I was also like, if I can be a strong woman, I want to encourage other people. So I had a lot of themes of like feminism and like women empowerment Natural early on. Themes. And I was very, I was trying really hard to like incorporate those. Like, I mean, when I was in like a Maya made presidency and stuff, I was trying to get, so we were going and doing cool things like the Boy Scouts did. And, um, it didn't fly with the other young woman. It didn't women. fly with the other young woman because they're like, no, that's, she that's was, stuff was for the wired boys, differently you know? than the other just, young women in our particular ward. Yeah. So I they think they liked the home. Very gender skills. stratified. Very much. The gender roles were very gender. strong. Um, and I just didn't like she that. She stood out like a sore thumb. Well, and it was also, I had both parents working. So it's like, I didn't see why not. Like, I mean, our, we had a functional family. Like, I didn't understand why. <laughs> yeah. Real quick. Just so, so moving back from Colorado within six months, I was working for the church and we will tell that story. Yeah. But so she was see, seeing parents work. She did see me work in Colorado. Yeah, some. In the salon, and then dad working and then it was a flip flop, you know? And we, so we, yeah, that's Chris why we were and so I, close as a family is because we had both parents in and out of the home so much. Yeah. And we both, we both parented our children, you know, yeah. early on, it was mostly me at home with the little ones, but by the time she was, Eight and older, we really we both parented, had really yeah. strong parenting and roles. Both earned income. Yes, both worked. Yes. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So, so I mean, that was hard. I feel like there was a bunch of stuff in my personality that I just that was um, just not I, right. It was kind of villainized almost. You I know? Uh, well, yeah, in our word it was. But as far as my perspective with that, I always said it's going to serve you well someday. Your personality. People might not like it right now. They might not understand right now. But my my message to her, I said, as a woman, it's going to serve you well. I knew it would. And so I... Yeah. I we kept hoping for that. And that was kind of what kept us like going. And yeah, I, I, so I, I encouraged it. I, I did have... I mean, occasionally I had some concerns. Um, but I didn't, I didn't realize the problem that lay ahead of us and the, um, the experiences that she would face feel culturally until later, like how intense it would become for her until a little bit later. 12 was a little, (laughs) 12 was a little early. Um, and she wasn't really completely coming into her own yet. Yeah. Cause I mean, I enjoyed a lot of the craft. I was very crafty. I enjoyed artistic. Yeah. You didn't love the crafts. Okay. Some of the crafts because they wanted me to do exactly how like, and I was very much like, oh, I want to do this my own We have a non-conformity blood a little bit in our family. So (laughs) yeah. But anyway, so that was, that was difficult, but I still was really trying to live the church stuff. Um, But like watching all the stuff with my grandpa, he was kind of like almost painted in a dangerous light. We didn't ever want to talk to grandpa about church. Um, And I remember like, I have this one, one memory of my mom arguing with my grandma about church stuff and I was trying to keep my little siblings in the basement playing so they didn't hear a lot of that stuff. So I like kind of had to sometimes had to step into that protective older sister role to keep my sisters like out of that, um, those negative emotions. So that kind of, those negative emotions did trickle down to some extent. And I think the biggest blowout where I didn't talk to my grandpa for a couple of years after my patriarchal blessing, because he had taken me and one of my cousins rollerblading for the day. And so we were rollerblading on this trail and he was just attacking religion over and over. And me, as this 12, 13-year-old who is really trying to be faithful, really trying to do everything I'm supposed to, I'm just I'm just almost like verbally fighting my grandpa about all these things. And just, I mean, he brought up all sorts of topics and called, he would 
he referred to my patriarchal blessing as um, fortune telling because I told him about it because that was a big thing as a 12 year old. I'm like, guess what, Grandpa? I got my patriarchal blessing. I don't think he would have known about it if you hadn't been with him that day exactly. and you, and the patriarch called to come and pick it up. Yeah. So the patriarch called and uh, said, hey, it's ready if you want to come pick it up. And my grandpa was like, oh, I, oh, I know I him. Know him. I, I can uh, we can go, go get it, it when we I take you home. And so um I, this, yeah, it was really hard because I'm like, oh, grandpa, I'll just go in and get it. You don't have to come in. And he's like, no, I want to come in. I want to say hi. Like, I want to, da, da, da. And um, there was this huge tension between the patriarch and my grandpa as I'm trying to get my patriarchal blessing. And um, the patriarch, he gives me this big hug and he's like, you're special. Don't ever forget that. And I'm like, okay. So now I'm just like, so it's this big conflict. Again, between, we're in a position where my dad's being villainized. What did yeah. he want? What, what was he trying to do? He was, he just went in to visit with the patriarch because he knew very, him on, it was on a yeah. first name basis as, as friends. Uh, my dad's pretty well known in the community and just knows the patriarch. So he happened to have Savannah with him when the, the, pa the patriarchal blessing was ready to pick up, to take home. So my dad was the one that took her to the patriarch's home to pick it up, went in and visited. And there yeah. was the, like was tension very, about was what it was, tension. the patriarch. Any idea what your dad was thinking or feeling? He just probably thought it was dumb. And well, like, he <laughs> he and I had a blow up um, a few days later at a family gathering about it, um, and he he said uh, he told me that he you know it was fortune telling and just given me that whole line, and I and I I bit back, and I didn't usually do that with him, but. Um, really it was really uncomfortable and he brought he started bringing up all kinds of things you know that he'd been learning and, and I wasn't in a space to hear it you know so um our relationship was really strained at that point and I really did not like him and I did not want him to be around my kids and um I, I'm so sad saying it now well but, it's again this is like so important that we talk about this or at least shine a light on it yeah from your dad's perspective yeah. Well, from you as a believer, your perspective is here's this man who's who's he's desecrating our sacred beliefs. He's yeah. he's anti-Mormon. He's trying to tear down my sacred beliefs. He's fighting against God and Jesus and all righteousness. Yeah. What a wicked, evil, bad I man. I thought of yeah. something that, I do want to share. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, far. I'll just say what from your perspective, it's what a wicked, evil, bad man that's trying to tear our faith down yeah. and fight against Jesus and God. Yeah, I That's do your perspective, and that's valid. Right. And then from his perspective, it's like, I'm trying to save... I'm, he's feeling like his, his child and his grandchildren maybe are in a cult or are maybe in a high-demand religion yeah. or maybe just are going down a path that's yeah. not true, yeah. that's not right, that could hurt them later. Right. So from his perspective, he's just saying, I'm trying to I'm trying to wake up. I'm trying to save my child. I'm trying to save yes. my grandchildren from further pain yes. later. I'm trying to help them not live, base their life in something that isn't true. But you're seeing him as evil and wicked. He's seeing himself as trying to help you. How do you bridge just, that gap? It, it, it's yeah. it's so hard to bridge that gap. You know, in that moment when we had that blow up, I do remember the one thing that he said that set me off the very most. And and I said it was something about um, I said, would you would you kill my my children's faith? You know, and he said, absolutely, absolutely, I would kill their faith. Mm. You know, I would take down like their faith. And I I felt like I'd been smacked. You know, and I'm like, what more confirmation do I need to keep them away from you then? You know, if you're not going to help them have faith and believe in God and believe in, and, you know, equating God and the religion as one, you know, that it's all lumped together as one. Um, you know, I, I was so upset and we, there was no way we were going to be able to, to bridge the gap or meet in the middle. It just, it just tore us apart. My relationship with my dad was terrible. At yeah. that time, you know, and to, and to have my children be, um, you know, the sparks for some of these these awful interactions was was really hard too because I want them to be able to spend time with their grandpa. I want them to have these this relationship with my dad. I love my dad. He's a great man. You Gr do love him. Oh, and absolutely. You think he's a great man. I absolutely love my dad. Cherish my dad. <laughs> yeah. So it's hard to it's hard yeah. to think how much I've hurt him, but it was unknowing. He knows. You know, as I never meant to hurt him. So, yeah, he is a great man, and he will always be a great man to me. 
And the, uh, those moments were hard. Yeah, and take I mean, it away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after that experience, like with my grandpa, just kind of like attacking my beliefs. And that was a new thing for me. I was told I was like, I was 12. Yeah. Cause, and, um, he has so much more power than you. Yeah, right? exactly. I'm just like, okay, girl. like grandpa, why are you attacking these things that are so special to me? And that I feel very proud of. Cause I mean, at this point I'm this huge church overachiever. <laughs> I'm like, I'm being ambitious. I'm doing the things I'm supposed to. And this was the first You're time. Righteous. And the first yeah. time that my beliefs were attacked was by my grandpa. And that was on the side of the family. <laughs> that was on the side of the family that I got along with better. I always got along better with my mom's side of the family than my dad's side, because my dad's side's super traditional, super Mormon. And even though I was like very Mormon at the time, I still like got along better with my mom's side. And so, and then I didn't talk to my grandpa for a few years after that, just what? because that hurt so much as a kid. And I spent very minimal time with my mom's side of the family because it was like, this is so bad. I don't need this on my journey, you know? And I think there was like a little sprinkle of like, well, I guess they're not going to be there in heaven when I get there, which was a very hard thing. And I'm like, I sh looking back, I'm like, you're 12. You shouldn't be thinking about an eternal perspective. You shouldn't have to be grieving a hypothetical loss of family members. Yeah. You shouldn't be dealing with all these big existential problems. You should be being a kid and like enjoying life before you like are an adult, you know? And um, I feel like a lot of that stuff made me mature a lot faster than I would have liked to. Um, I mean, sure. I was, I was always told I was very mature for my age and I think that came from a lot, um, a lot dealing with a lot of like big concepts, very young. Um, it was all very tough stuff to like think about as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I remember being like super worried about like second coming stuff. Like I was, um, I mean, I was 12, 13 around that time I got my patriarchal blessing. I was really diving into like Joseph Smith, Matthew, which is like the whole, um, part of the Book of Mormon that's talking about when Jesus comes again and all the terrible things that are going to happen and what we need to do to be prepared for that. And so I'm just, this is a very real thing for me. Um, to what about the second coming? It was, was like, I mean, in my patriarchal blessing, I was told when the second coming happens, you will be called forward and all the righteous people that you help convert will follow behind you. So in my brain, I'm just like, okay, God's going to come down. He's going to be like, Savannah, you were righteous. Like, and then bring all the people you helped convert with you. And what and if so, Mormonism happens to the people who aren't righteous during the second coming? They go to outer darkness, um, which is worse than that. It's they yeah, get burned, burned they, and it's destroyed. Like yeah. Hail and fire. fire and it's just awful. And lava. Yeah. And, and so and the wicked are burned. Yeah. And, and so it's like, I knew right? that there was no way to, cause my grandpa's very stubborn, very blunt. <laughs> um, which I feel like I got some of those qualities actually. Maybe a few. Um, but um, yeah, I'm like, okay, I guess I don't want to spend time with him. I don't want to get attached to him because he's not going to be there. And that was a very, um, very real fact for me. And so I kind of kept going with, I didn't tell her that. <laughs> I know, but like I was doing a ton of reading on my own. I loved books. I loved reading. I loved all the stories. Like I love stories like, and um, especially like Gen like the creation myth and Genesis um, and all that jazz, you know? Um, very, like a very intellectual approach to things. And I just wanted to learn as much as I can. And that was a very real concept for me because I was being told that is real. And um, yeah. So you're saying you went a couple years. Did I hear you say that right? You went a couple years without really talking to your grandpa? Yeah, there's definitely a gap in there where I just don't have any memories speaking to him. So, and um, it was, I don't really, I didn't really rekindle that relationship with my grandpa until I was maybe like 16 or 17. So let me just take a tiny quick moment just to, this is kind of a coaching moment for people because I care about families. We care about families. That's one of the main things we're trying to do is keep families together. If you are going through a faith crisis and you're a parent or a grandparent or spouse, doesn't matter, or kid, the most important thing you can do is make your believing family feel safe. It's way more important to make them feel safe than to try and educate them or change their mind. Because if you get angry and forceful with them and try and cram your knowledge down their throats, what you create is called the backfire effect, mm -hmm. which means they actually cling tighter to their beliefs and then they, which you don't want, you don't want them believing more strongly in the things that you don't believe, but then they also push you away because they see you as unsafe and as dangerous and as bad and evil. So your strategy as a questioner and or non-believer with your believing family 
has to be, I will not talk to you about my doubts. I will keep them private and I will just do whatever I can to make you feel safe, spouse, make you feel safe, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, make you feel safe, child or grandchild. And that way they want to keep you in their lives. And that way later they will become more open to asking you questions or getting feedback when their own questions naturally arise, you'll feel safe to them. And again, you won't be creating the opposite thing that you want, which is distance from them and strengthening their beliefs. And I just, I have to call that out because it is the counterintuitive smartest way to approach believing uh, family and friends. For that, sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think totally. that that's fair, but it's super hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my dad wasn't always good at it, but boy, he got better at it. Yeah, he's gotten so much better. <laughs> because of his love for us. Yeah. Like he got a lot better at that. He would hold his tongue. He would try to support us when he could. He got really, really good at it. And and for his personality type, that was extremely difficult. So hats off to my dad. He got a lot better at that. He I did. Mean, he did. So, yeah, that was definitely the first relationship I really cut off due to religion. And um, there were, unfortunately, there were a lot more to follow because as I went into junior high, um, I was very much a goody two shoes in addition to my like church stuff. So I was this very, um, I had, a, I was felt very superior. I was very like academically like inclined. I got a ton of like awards in school. I got all my religion stuff. I was a very good church attending. And at this point I'm like, okay, I need to start converting my friends. Cause I'd found like a really good seventh grade, like friend group that I hung out with every day in the library. And, um, half of them were not Mormon. And so I had, um, I had like handful that I like saw at, you know, at like steak activities, but then the other half, it was like, we never, we didn't see them on the weekends or anything just because we didn't see them at church. And, um, I tried very hard to convert them all. <laughs> and, um, eventually it was just like, they were like, dude, we can't deal with you pushing all these beliefs. Uh, we're not like that. We, this isn't like that's crazy. Although, like you're at, I mean, now I look at it and it's like, um, you're asking somebody to change their entire lifestyle. You know, what were the kind of things that you'd say to them or conversations you had? With I them? would get after them for like, for swearing and dirty jokes. And I would get, I would just like, um, get mad at them for like policing them, policing them, basically driving away the spirit. Exactly. So it's just, yeah, I would try to get them to come to church. And when they didn't want to, I was like, well, I don't want you guys to like go to hell, you know? <laughs> um, and uh, eventually I actually had friends cut me off and I cut friends off. Really? Um, some of which I've actually been able to rekindle now that I'm not in the church anymore. And one of them is actually my roommate now. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, they had me blocked for like five years. <gasps> We discovered, yeah. discovered that. It was kind of, it was he had really her blocked funny on his because, phone. Yeah, so he's my roommate now. Um, but uh, we were friends in like seventh, eighth grade. And he was he was never Mormon, but we were, we were friends. And um, I just got so sick of all of his jokes. He was always like doing all this stuff. And he wasn't even that bad. I look back now and I'm like, that was so minimal. Um, but eventually it got to the point where I told him he needed to like fix his life basically. And he like, we stopped talking, but I, I guess he blocked me. And then years later, after we graduate high school, we start talking again and we have a mutual friend who was also in that seventh grade friend group. And um, we can't, he's picking me up from the airport <laughs> and I can't, we can't figure out why the phone, like our, he can't call me and I can't call him, you know? And then uh, a couple weeks later, he was like, do you still have the same number from when, from seventh grade? And I was like, yeah, why? And he's like, he unblocks me on his phone. He had it blocked. <laughs> and I cried. I was just yeah. like, oh my gosh. Cause it's like, I felt so much guilt for all the things I'd said and guilted people for not being like good enough Mormons or not even being Mormon. And um, I, I ruined a lot of relationships very early on due to that. I had no idea she was doing that. I, was, oh, I, mean, I that's wasn't encouraging like you're missionary to do. behavior. What do, you, what do you mean you're supposed to do? I mean, when you are a righteous person, your number one priority becomes 
getting converting people. And especially where I'd just gotten my patriarchal right. blessing, where I was in the tribe of Ephraim, my job was to be a missionary. Half my blessing half my blessing was like, you're gonna preach to many lands, to many people, and you're gonna bring a lot of people a lot of happiness by bringing them to the church. And I remember telling one of my other friends, like, I'm gonna convert you. Like I brought her to church a couple times and she was like, You said I'm, I'm gonna convert you. Yeah, to- I oh, no. did. I was like I was I was She's a, twelve. I was yeah, yeah. like I was seventh grader. <laughs> yeah. And like eventually that was kind of yeah, and I mean, up through eighth grade, I was very much a goody two shoes, very Mormon. Um, yeah, just very much so. Where the only friends that I had were others who were very, very Mormon. So eventually, all the non Mormon friends I'd had faded away or like got cut off or they cut me off, and all those friendships stopped. And the only ones I had left were all my Mormon friends. Um, and then eventually, I well, got yeah. Just so don't don't forget okay. what you're about to say. I just want to call this out. Okay. So there's a couple things going on there. One is high demand religions and organizations teach cultural superiority. They teach that believers and in group members are superior to out group members, mm-hmm. which of course creates of course creates this natural division. Mm-hmm. Um, it, they have to teach a sense of superiority. They also teach proselytizing. So, um, so, you know, you wanting to be a missionary, it's just a way to make you, you know, reinforce the fact that you are superior yes. and that you have a lot to teach other people. And, and there's also milieu control going on because all these people in Utah County that aren't living the standards are getting excluded from things, which then sends a message, hey, if you want to be included, you need to get with the program and join the group. Yeah. yeah. And so all of these things are coming by you very naturally because these are really important reinforcement techniques that the church and high demand religions use to their adva- to their advantage. So you're you're just you're coming by it honestly because that's how the system is yeah, designed. Exactly. Yeah. Um yeah. yeah. So all my friends up through like 8th and ninth grade were all Mormon, like all very good Mormons too, like ones that followed all the rules that and all the standards. And, um, I mean, we did group temple trips and things. We all went to girls camp together. We went to youth conference together. And, um, then I was, I just felt, I just didn't feel right. I was like, my mental health started spiraling. I, um, just didn't ever feel fully like include, like no matter how much I did or how good of a Mormon I was, I always didn't fit the mold just because of I felt who I felt I was and how my ambition ambitions and I mean you're told like all the things like the, to be like as a woman you know you're just like you're going to be a mom and I wanted a career like I was From very get-go. I was very driven like I and I'm like okay so I had to deal with this trying to compartmentalize how am I going to do both like there's no way that I'm going to have the life I want if I have kids and like and it's just yeah, so all of that was really hard. And um, for those things, I got a lot of backlash. And I always asked so many questions. So like all like all of a sudden, I completely surrounded myself with this church atmosphere. And it was closing in on me. So I would ask a ton of questions in Sunday school. And I would get shot down by my classmates and my teachers. And um, I was a huge history buff. And I was like, that doesn't sound right for a lot of things. I had Like what types of things? So I actually had a um, young women's leader teach us that Columbus and Henry VIII were both like sent by God to further the church thing so that the Mormon church could exist. Mm-hmm. And in that same year, I was had learned that Columbus was the reason we had a mass genocide and that Henry VIII literally created the um, Church of England for so he could divorce his wife. And so in my brain, I'm just like, these were not good guys. These are actually some of the worst ones we I got. Think he decapitated his Yeah, he like, wife. I mean, he had a yeah. bunch of them. Some of them he decapitated. Some of them he like created the Church of England so he could divorce them. But yeah, I had this teacher saying that like these were divine men who were like put there so that the church could exist later in America. Just like, wait a minute. I'm just like, uh, listen, sister, I don't think that's right. <laughs> um, and did you I, call her out that day? Or did I, you, I, I remember I, talking about it after church. We had I, a conversation. After I think church. I may have walked out actually and like gone like just to leave the classroom because I was like, I can't, I can't deal with this because I'd already been shot down for a bunch of other things because like I. Um, 
I remember advocating for like other religions and how other religions kind of understood other concepts better. Like supposing like the Mormon church was the only true church, but other religions had pieces, right? And some of the, I, I think I said, other religions have other pieces that they probably understand better than we do, even though we have the same pieces. And there, and then I had another young woman snap at me and be like, but this is the only true one, like the only completely true one. And I'm just like, okay. And so it was, that was happening over and over again from teachers and and like like bishops and classmates. I w- and, and I wasn't with her. Like I wasn't yeah. with her in these classes at church when a lot of this stuff was happening. So I was hearing a little bit, it started to happen a little bit after church where we would discuss some of the things, the experiences that yeah. she was having. So it was, it was slow, but it was steady. And it just happened over and over again. And then I got to the point where I'm just like, okay, I need to make sure that if I'm gonna do all this like fully and be full, fully in, I need to understand the f- complete history. And that's when like you dive into things, you know? Um, I started reading like as much as I could get my hands on. I read a gospel topics essay. Um, my mom actually has this Bible that has different versions of the Bible all side by side. So you can see the difference um, in comparison. And so um, eventually when I was like 16, 17, I started like staying home from church or leaving early sometimes. And I would do my own Bible study because I found it way more, I learned way more on my own from that and rather she was than, getting in church she wasn't getting anything I wasn't getting anything because like it was all was the same things eventually feeding that intellect and feeding that heart it wasn't yeah happening. so I wanted to have a full understanding and then all of a sudden just like the more and more like things pile up I mean we talk about yeah so, so what I want to do is I know that um I know Linda that you have your whole yeah. you know parallel to this and even before mm-hmm. you're having you you become an employee employee of the church and you're working for the church and, and a combination of your experiences with the church and then seeing how things start to unravel for Savannah, yeah, that becomes kind of where for the whole family, everything starts to unravel. So yes. if it's okay, Savannah, like, I think you've brought us to a really important point, which yeah, is definitely. how things start unraveling for you. Yeah. Is that right? This is true. So, yeah. so I mean, that's, thank you for taking yeah. us to that point. Is, is it okay if we pause that? <laughs> yeah, for sure. We'll go back to your mom's journey with the church. Yeah, that sounds great. And then we'll take it and we'll come right back to the point okay, where yeah. then those things kind of come together and really start. But what I hear from you is saying that, that things started to unravel. Oh, yeah. Just the culture yeah. got very, very toxic when you start asking questions. And all of a sudden it was a... Uh, Oh, she's that one. I got written off as the ward feminist yeah. and I just asked way too many questions. Well, we want to hear all, yes, we, absolutely. We, I literally want to hear every single <laughs> one of those questions <laughs> all right. and I want to understand yeah. in depth how your faith unraveled. Totally. I just want to, yeah, I we want can to make totally sure jump over. we'll, we'll totally jump cool. back to your mom's story and then we'll come right back to it. Yeah. And we'll good. hit that very hard and in depth. So I don't want you to feel <laughs> all right, ignored cool. or silence. We're going to, we're going to dig deep. Is that all okay? right. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so Linda, let's yeah. back up a little bit now. Okay. And when you come back from Colorado, mm-hmm. Fort Collins, Fort when Collins, you come back, Fort when Collins. you move to Utah from Fort Collins, an interesting relationship that you end up having with your bishop yes. leads to you working for the church. Is that, is that yeah, maybe I'm, the next I'll place to go? I'll back you up even a little bit okay. further okay. Uh, just to kind of talk about this um, relationship with uh, the bishop. Okay. And Savannah's story is a cliffhanger. Savannah's story is a cliffhanger <laughs> that we're going to come back to. Okay. Right. Yeah, so we lived in Mapleton. We had a small home in Mapleton that we lived in before we moved to Colorado. Okay, so my relationship with this particular bishop uh, that I want to kind of bring into the story um, started there. So before we ever even left to Colorado, I like I said, I had daddy issues. I had these religious issues with my dad. I had all of these problems um, that I was trying to to deal with. Um, and so while we were living in Mapleton, while the three kids were young, um, I we were going to ch- we were going to church pretty steady at that point. And um, my bishop there. And I'm going to try really hard not to say his name because he's a big part of my story. So I'll talk about him a fair amount. But um, I started talking to him one-on-one and building a relationship with him. And he he stepped in as almost kind of like a father figure for me um, and just filled a little bit of a hole. He was, he was very willing to talk about spirituality, very um, compassionate individual. Um, I was in a very, very vulnerable place um, when it came to just, just, you know, my situation with my dad, 
I just, it was always in my heart, always on my mind. It was just a, such a huge part of my story. And so he stepped in and, and kind of made me feel special. Um, you know, that I just, um, you know, that my spirituality was a gift. Um, a lot of those kinds of things. Um, but during the period that we lived in this house, it was four or five years that we lived in that house in Mapleton when the kids were young. Um, he was our bishop that entire time. Uh, Exmo Lex was in our ward. So this is the Lexi same. Lexi McDonald. Lexi McDonald. Yeah, She's in she, your ward. Yeah, she was a little one. She was young. She's a little bit older than Savannah. She was a teen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, fine. yeah. So Shout same, same word. Lex. Yeah. So I don't know that she will remember me, but my husband served with her dad. So for the time that we we're there. So this particular bishop, um, I felt I did fall away for about six months during the time that we lived in this first Mapleton house. And the reason was I was up at my parents' house one day, nobody was up there. And I noticed, um, the book, the 19th wife sitting on my dad's counter in his kitchen <laughs> and curiosity killed the cat. Like I, started just kind of thumbing through it because I, I like books. I like to learn. And I stole it. I brought, I took it home and I read the whole thing cover to cover, like, like that. I mean, it was, I couldn't, I couldn't put it down. Um, do you want to go into what that book, that book is a book about, uh, one of Brigham Young's wives that went rogue (laughs) kind of really in a nutshell, you know? So she basically told her story, um, early on and, uh, Met ro- went rogue in what way? Against Mormonism, against Brigham Young, lost against faith. lost her faith, and told the whole story. So for me to find that book and read it was really, really eye opening. I'd never read anything that was considered anti at that point, but I was so curious. You know, what's driving my dad? You know, it was just a curiosity thing. So I took it home, read it, fell away for six months. Like we, after that, we did not go to church for six months. Really? Yeah. So I had kind of a first little mini faith crisis during that time. And this, uh, and my husband has been great it, through all of my faith <laughs> in and out on my, all my experiences. He's been great. Let's me drive the religion bus. And he just kind of does what I do. He stayed home with us, supported us, was really great. But, um, this Bishop reached out to me kind of after the six months and I had been not very nice to even primary teachers that came to our door, trying to take, bring things to my kids at that time. And just said, you don't think I'm teaching my kids about God? You know, don't like, I've got it kind of a thing. I wasn't, I wasn't super nice to one or two people that were trying to fellowship at that time. Um, but this Bishop decided he was going to reach out and, um, he wanted to talk to me about it. That's when we really started developing this relationship. And he said, when I told him, I'm like, look, I have questions. There's some, I've read some things that are really hard for me. And he told me, he says, why are you looking for diamonds in sewage? You know, that was the line that he gave me. And it made sense at the time. It's like, yeah, it doesn't feel very good. It does feel like sewage. It's awful, awful stuff. And I don't want to read it anymore. I don't want to learn anymore about it. I don't want to. And I really, I really hadn't gone past that book. I didn't dive any deeper. And I just have to call it out. That's a, a thought stopping cliche is what that's called. Yeah. It's, it's some pithy quote that packs a very heavy emotional punch yeah. that gets you to stop learning and stop thinking because high demand religions mm-hmm. have to control the information that their members receive and they have, because they need to control them from having questions mm-hmm. that might lead to doubts and then disbelief. And so things like they leave the church, they can't leave it alone. Yeah. Um, doubt your doubts. Yeah. Why are you looking for diamonds and sewage? Those yeah. are all thought stopping yeah. techniques to get you not not to learn. And I'm not saying that bishop's a bad human. No, he's not. But it's we have to learn to call out these techniques because they're effective. <laughs> oh, unfortunately. Yeah, it was, it was effective for me, you know, and like I said, I was in a vulnerable place and he stepped in, you know, during that time and said, you know, I, he, and he'd said too, I read, I read a lot of those things too. And kind of told me his story that he had been, um, uh, ostracized from his family when he converted at a, as a older teenager, you know, so shared his story with me. And so we just had, I just felt like we had a lot in common. Um, he was a writer. I wanted to be a writer. So we just had a lot of these commonalities. We're both super into spirituality, um, both pretty creative. We just had lots in common. So he became kind of a father figure for me. And I just revered him, revered him, would have done anything to please him. It was kind of a, it was a, I just transferred these feelings that I wanted to have for my dad to him. And it was unhealthy. It was kind of, 
it, we just would have these really deep spiritual conversations. Um, and it was never, never ever in a, in a bad way or anything, you know, but it's what like, do you mean to, never in a bad way? like, you know, where people go, okay, did you have like weird feelings for him or anything like so that? Sexual or anything? Sexual no, absolutely review. not. Right. No, right. no. And he's not. like my dad's age, yeah. you know, they're within months of each other in age. And so it was always very much like a father figure for me. And I think that it was a, I think it was similar for him. But over the course of our relationship, he he would try to kind of label what what our relationship was, and neither one of us could ever label it as like, I don't know, like a father daughter type thing. Or a fr- I always just kind of called it a friendship because it was a friendship for me. I don't know what it was for him. I think it was it, it got a little weirder for him because he started putting me on a pedestal, and I'll get into that a little bit and making me feel like super special, and that was weird. It's called love bombing. It was weird. You know, and it, it made me uncomfortable. But and so I was always making sure that I was super clear with my husband. I would talk to my husband about everything that we talked about. You know, because that made me feel at peace about the relationship with this bishop. It's just that I was being clear that I was talking to somebody else about it. You know, everything that we were talking about. When you say talking, are you like on the phone? Are you in the bishop's office? These Where are, are these like lots of emails. Okay, lots of emails. So occasionally in the bishop's office, um, we didn't really have a lot of phone conversations. So early on, it was just a lot of emails. And throughout our whole relationship, really, it was a lot of email because we did end up working together. So, um, I just have to say a couple quick things. Okay, that, that, sorry, we're bringing up everything. No, this is so good. <laughs> this is so important. I mean, we just did an episode, uh, the Shakespeare episode, where we talk about. When a when an adult woman is alone with an adult married man you know, behind closed doors or in emails for a long period of time, a couple yeah. things happen. One is you're developing emotional intimacy yeah. with someone that isn't your husband. Yeah. So that's one thing that doesn't necessarily have to be bad. We can have yeah. friendships. Yeah. But if you combine the emotional intimacy that you're developing with the power differential, which yeah. is he is your authority. He is right. in a position of priesthood power. He's God's spokesman for you. Yeah. That is a power differential that that can be abused and it can go mm-hmm. into the sexual path, which it did, you know, it does with so many. Right. Sometimes it can go to an abuse path where yeah. a bishop or a mission president will tell a woman she's going to be a plural wife or whatever, yeah. or abuse them, Lots or of infidelity stories. happens. That can happen. Mm-hmm. But even if it never goes down that awful road, you know, these bishops aren't trained as therapists or as counselors. They don't, they aren't taught boundaries. They aren't taught healthy boundaries. They aren't taught about dual relationships. And yeah. they aren't taught the basic ethics of, right. of neutrality. So a therapist is taught, it's not your job as a counselor or a therapist to promote your values to your mm-hmm. clients. Right. It's your job to help them figure out what's best for them. Mm-hmm. And your values don't matter. You're supposed to be values neutral and just facilitate their healing and growth. Yeah. That's the only ethical position in that power differential. Right. Because otherwise you're in a position of a father figure, which is not appropriate, honestly, for yeah. this man who is representing the church. Yeah. And the only, there's only one good path that you, Linda, need to follow <laughs> And he's representing that path yeah. with that power differential. And then he's using that love bombing and that emotional intimacy that you're developing to then have you follow the path that you're supposed to be leading. And that's that's unethical. And it leads to a lot yes. of harm if it's not the worst case scenario of sexual abuse or infidelity. Something more benign is absolute power and control over your path yeah. with that untrained counseling position, power differential. And I don't mean to make it sound so awful, no. but we have to learn to identify what's going on. Oh, here. absolutely. I and appreciate it. And he's gaining it. all this influence in your, in your life yeah. with good intentions. And that's yeah. the thing. It's not like he's this bad man. He's just trying to help you. Yeah. Yeah. So is that okay? Oh, Tell absolutely. me if I'm wrong about all no, that. No, I appreciate that so very much because well, well, just because for me, like I, I didn't know, I, you don't know what's appropriate. You don't know what the boundaries are. You don't know, you know, how much to interact, what the appropriateness, like there's no guidelines. There's nothing to know, you know, he didn't know. I didn't know, you know, so we're just having a lots, lots of conversation, you know, and it was feeling, it was feeling a void for me. And it was filling a void for him. 
like coming to find out like he had mommy issues. His mom had MS with his entire growing up. She wasn't present, you know, so he's putting me on this strange pedestal, you know, as being like, you know, kind of special divine having abilities and things like that. And I'm going, and that was always weird to me. You know, anytime he kind of pushed that on me, I was like, that doesn't feel right. You know, I'm, did it also feel good a little bit? There at moments, I think it felt good, but I think I had a, a, a good enough upbringing to know, you know, I, I had some boundaries, you know, I think way more than he did as far as, um, how much communication and whatnot, not early on, but my boundaries grew a lot stronger as our relationship went on. I'm just saying it's God, a Bishop represents God to Mm -hmm. a ward member and here God's mouthpiece, the Bishop is telling you how amazing you are. That's gotta be validating. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was validating. Well, especially when you come from and a I background of always feeling shame and unworthiness. Now, Absolutely. the highest leader for you in your congregation is telling you how amazing you are. Yeah. So it was very validating for me. It was. I absolutely was. And he, in order to kind of pull me back in, he says, I want to give you a calling. You know, and I'm like, okay. You know, I hadn't been to church in six months. And I'm like, okay, maybe I can do this. And this is after having a one on one interview. Um, with him. And he said, you know, I, I want you to teach Relief Society. And I went, are you kidding me? You know, I, he said, he says, just, non-moms. so this is just the women's group. There's an hour that's um, one of the, th- the three hour block, which was then is two hours now. They're getting a little more progressive, but um, yeah. So I would teach one, one week of the month, the women. In church, in church, on Sunday, in church, all the, women, on Sunday. All the adult women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of an honor, right? It, yeah. And it would be, it would be from the conference talks, you know, it would be that one particular talk, um, uh, that they would choose. And, and I said, I, what if I run into something that I can't teach that I can't, you know, feel good about? And he's like, we're going to cater this calling to you, not you to the calling. And I went, okay, all right, I'm in, I can do that. If there's something, because that was within my comfort zone, if there's something I can't teach, whether it's Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or whatever, I can say, nope, I can't do that one. Give me something else. And so that made it doable. So for a while I, I, I taught and some of my lessons I think were <laughs> very uncond- unconventional, you know, but the women were also very kind and they were probably fellowshipping me too at that point. Um, but it was good for me. So that was, that was really the nutshell of the story that I wanted to talk about while we were in the Mapleton for the first time before we moved to Colorado as I'd established this relationship, this close friendship, this father figure relationship with this bishop. And then we moved to Colorado and it was fine. And we really kind of lost touch during those three years that we were in Colorado. He, during the, those three years that I was gone, he ended up getting a job with the church, becoming the manager of the editing department up there. Which means what? So he uh, just managed all of the editors and the church actually has a lot of editors, very, very few writers, lots and lots of editors. So um, he just was over running, you know, helping run them run their schedules, helping their their projects. So so people don't know what that means. Okay. So the church puts out a lot of, um, a lot of uh, writing, you know, in all kinds of areas, magazines, um, digital, lots and lots of digital nowadays. I used to be the magazines a lot, but the magazines aren't focused on nearly as much now. Websites, websites, blog 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 posts, posts. articles. Yeah. 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 And there's lots of different departments. There's also a huge translation department where everything that's written, many things that are deemed important enough are translated into multiple languages, huge translation department. Um, so yeah, he, so he was over all of the, the editors and, um, really their editing was just editing like grammar, punctuation. Um, they weren't correlation. This is actual editors that could get a job in any magazine, any, any place, you know, that's putting out digital content being editors. So that was his job. So he was over the managers or managing over the editors. Um, while I was in Colorado, I didn't know that he'd gotten that job. I didn't know where he was working. We did kind of lose touch during that time. Uh, then about six months before we were thinking about moving back, I did hear from him and he said, Hey, are you interested in just trying to write some articles for the church? And I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, cause I was just, I was just a lowly hairstylist at this point. And I was, I was aspiring, I was growing and I'd expressed to him how much I wanted to be a writer. And at the time I was really wanting to be a novelist. I'm like, I just want to write books. I want to be a novelist, very creative person. So, um, so I said, yes. And so he's like, okay, he's like, we have some, uh, articles 
there are some talks by Boyd K. Packer that we want to um, kind of highlight. So it, it was all about kind of boosting PR for Boyd K. Packer was the first things that I wrote about. So I'd go through his his conference talk or whatever they were wanting to me, me to go over and I would just soften everything. You know, soften the language, soften the message, and Is make this for it for an insight article. Tumblr. Or I would be article? writing like it would be like a, a conference talk, like a, a talk that he'd given in general conference that would be given to me, and I would keep the message from it, but just kind of soften the language. And for what for the platform of like Tumblr, like in, like social media, or you know, just a, I would rewrite an article based on what he had taught. So let, let me tell me if I have this right, and I want you to correct me because you lived it. So, so the church has a website, mm -hmm. which is its face to the world and to the membership, mm -hmm. which is going to be releasing articles regularly. Mm -hmm. And then the church has these monthly magazines. Traditionally, it was called the Ensign, right? And then that's for the U.S. English speaking version of the church's monthly magazine to the membership. Yeah, that's to the adults. And then there's the New Era, which is a magazine, monthly magazine to the youth. youth. And then there's the Children's Friend, which is a magazine to the children. Right. And then there's the Liahona, which historically was global. a version of the Ensign, but, but globally. Mm -hmm. And these articles primarily are for believing members to help an ongoing education slash indoctrination right. as to what the brethren are saying, what the top leaders mm -hmm. are saying, what they want the members to know, yes. what the monthly message needs to be in the home teaching lesson or in the yep. visiting teaching lesson when those home teachers come to teach the families. Yeah, And then it's also like, as the church enters into the social media realm, how the the teachings of the First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, gets communicated not just to the membership but to the world. Yeah. So this is this is all education slash indoctrination mm -hmm. to the members in the world. Yes, and then sometimes like a talk by Elder Packer would be pretty harsh, mm -hmm. or even condemning to LGBT people or to women or whatever. Right. Okay. Now. Okay. So your role then is. Yeah. So my role uh, with these first articles, and it wasn't like overtly said, you know, this is Boyd K. Packer. We want you to boost his PR. We want you to make him sound nice. <laughs> you know, it was, it was really just an article that he had, he had, you know, or a talk he had given that was given to me saying, let's just write another more conversational piece on based on this message. So it really wasn't given to me like, you know, let's fix, let's fix this or make it better or, you know, or give boost his PR. It wasn't handed to me in that way. Um, so it was just to re repackage it, or mm -hmm, repackage it, make it more conversational. Okay. So, and that's, that's often what I did. 